Sri. So I'm going to try and take you on another pathway, completely different. Uh, a lot of people of, uh, wouldn't even have seen uh, a lot of stuff which I'm going to talk. Uh, but uh, it is important that uh, you see what is possible. And this is actually a very important concept because uh, I, I, like I was saying when, I'm, when we were doing that SVC lecture, that um, the cardiac surgeons made a huge mistake. Uh, they let go of uh, coronary angiograms and you know basic diagnostic techniques and uh, unfortunately now they cannot claim it back the same thing is happening uh, on the thoracic side but uh, you know from the word go we have as surgeons not let go of endobronchial surgery we've kept our feet in and uh, we are controlling the endobronchial surgery though the pulmonologists are trying very hard to just take it all away so I want you to, you know, look at it from that point of view. I want you to understand what are the potentials of thoracic surgery. You know, there is so much work that you can do uh, that you will never uh, go hungry. That's the reality. You will always have work. Provided you keep your horizons open, you keep your mind open to learn new things and you will see a lot of different things that you can do. And each one of it has a different set of skills. So the, when, when most of us who trained in the UK, our bread and butter was lung cancer surgery. Of course, when I came to India, it completely changed and it became uh, tuberculosis surgery. Uh, but uh, if you just look at lung cancer surgery, we as surgeons are being uh, you know, crowded from all sides. We've got the oncologists on one side who are coming in with targeted therapy. We've got the ablation therapy, the radiologists coming in with all their ablation catheters. And we've got now the radiotherapists who are coming with stereotactic uh, body radiation therapy, SBRT. And they are trying to take away even the stage 1A lung cancers from us. And so it is very, very, very important that you are sensitive to change. That's the important thing. You must remember that if you want to survive in a competitive environment, then you need to understand that change is inevitable. Anything that you're doing today, if you were doing the same thing 15 years ago, then the chances are you'll be left behind. So it's very, very, very important to keep up to date with the change that is happening. Uh, you can either choose to evolve with time, you can choose to become, uh, to learn new techniques, uh, or you can choose to become extinct. And that is the reality. I think, uh, you know, the, on the cardiac side, we are facing this quite a lot. A lot of work has gone away from our hands and the, and the cardiologists are just jumping in and doing everything. So all the young surgeons who are on this forum and who are listening to me, I want you to understand that you must be sensitive to change and you must learn all the new techniques that are available. So just because we're doing endobronchial surgery doesn't mean that we are, you know, competitors. Actually, endobronchial surgery is the best place where pulmonologists and thoracic surgeons can become friends and we can join our hands together in the hybrid OR and help each other do very, very, very complex procedures, okay? So with the onset of the hybrid OR, with the presence of Dyna CT, uh, with the presence of all the screening devices and everything and EMN and stuff like that, uh, I think uh, surgery has become pretty exciting and has changed uh, quite dramatically from what it used to be uh, 15 years ago. So what do you do in endobronchial surgery? Well, there are two types of procedures that you do in endobronchial surgery. One is, of course, the simple, straightforward diagnostic procedures. And then you come into the era of therapeutic procedures. So a lot of treatment can be done purely endobronchially. And I'll show you what is out there in the market. And you'll be surprised how much the scene of thoracic surgery has changed. And that is why, uh, you know, when people just talk about uh, good old uh, you know, thoracotomy and lobectomy, I, I want people to wake up and see that there is a lot of things that have changed and you really need to keep abreast of all the new technologies. So when you come into the uh, bronchoscopy era, you one is normal bronchoscopy, which you do using a either a rigid or a flexible bronchoscope. Uh, then you've got the era of interventional bronchoscopy, which I will talk about. Uh, you also have something called as intubation bronchoscopy, where uh, you use the bronchoscope in theater for uh, guiding your endotracheal tube, for making sure your isolation is correct, etc. cetera. Uh, EBUS and EUS is another world. I've put EUS in this category, but really we want to talk about EBUS 
So eBus is definitely another world altogether where you know a lot of progress has taken place, and now we've got some solid evidence backing the use of eBus. And last but not the least, electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. Uh, either it's called as EMN or ENV. Both of them are same structure, uh, same uh, terminologies. EMN means electromagnetic navigation and ENV means electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. So quite a lot of things have progressed and I'll try and take you into the details of all of these to show you what is available out there. So as I said earlier, we've got flexible and rigid bronchoscopies. Uh, there are three types. One is the simple, flexible, rigid, and now we are in the world of virtual bronchoscopy. So a lot of uh, CT scans and the softwares have an ability to recreate the whole bronchial tree, and you can actually follow the pathway exactly as if you are doing a bronchoscopy. So very often you can pick up lesions and you can pick up highlight uh, smaller uh, things within the pathway. And this is very important because when you operate, and you have seen the virtual bronchoscopy preoperatively, you can anticipate problems or you can anticipate complications or more importantly, you can anticipate abnormal anatomy. That is why virtual bronchoscopy becomes very, very important. And particularly when we are talking of era of stenosis and things like that, the virtual bronchoscopy helps you to get a very clear, accurate idea of where to make your cut, where to do the anastomosis and things like that. Um, the flexible bronchoscope that is available is uh, the standard one that we use is 4.2 millimeters. Uh, this is the one, it is, this is the processor of that bronchoscope. There is a whole, this is called as a video bronchoscopy. In the old days, it used to be ocular bronchoscopy, which means you put it to your eye and you looked in. Nowadays, almost nobody uses ocular bronchoscopes. Most of us have got this point, which we plug into the system, and then all the image is up on a video. So what we are really dealing with is video bronchoscopy. There is a suction system in there to allow you to suck. There is also a, uh, a procedure ca cannula, uh, sorry, a procedure channel. So you can actually put in instruments through the channel and you can do procedures uh, through the uh, flexible bronchoscope. And I'll talk about it in great detail. So there are various sizes available. There's 5.6, 4.9. Uh, 5.6 and 4.9 are more of the therapeutic bronchoscopes where we are doing procedures through it. The 3.6 to 4.2 is more of a diagnostic bronchoscope. And then the smaller sizes that you have almost down to 2.2 are more used in children and in pediatrics. And 2.2 is also used as an intubation bronchoscope down the double lumen tube. Now I have put this whole range of numbers because numbers change depending upon the company that's making it. So different companies have different uh, configurations. So really don't get stuck onto the number look at the bronchoscope head and it will clearly tell you what is the diameter of this uh, bronchoscope okay uh, not only do we have flexible bronchoscopies with fibers in it because light is emitted down the down a uh, fiber optic uh, cable but the problem with flexible bronchoscopy is that you have to clean it and cleaning the flexible bronchoscope is a big process it involves pre-cleaning uh, mechanical uh, cleaning, then post cleaning. There is a whole procedure, including uh, taking care of the bronchoscope to hang it accurately. The storage is also important. So there are at least six steps in cleaning. The problem with that is no matter what you do, you will end up with some infection left behind in the bronchoscope. So, so nowadays, they have come up with a new technique, uh, which is called as a flexible bronchoscope. So this is an Ambu bron bronchoscope. This is used by the uh, anesthetist predominantly, but they have also come up with a bigger size Ambu where you can actually do uh, therapeutic procedures uh, with this bronchoscope. The advantage of the Ambu's bronchoscope is that it is a disposable bronchoscope. It is small, it's a disposable bronchoscope and comes with a small screen like this. So you don't need the whole tower which I showed you earlier. All of this you don't really need. You just get back into the simple small screen and you can do a lot of procedures. Of course, complex therapeutic procedures can't be done with an Ambu's. So these are disposable single-use bronchoscopes, particularly very good when you're talking about the ICU, when you're talking about the theater. Uh, Guru Kiran, please shut off your microphone. So Ambu's is the 
these are by these are licensed for single use but in india i know that people use it for about uh, 10 times uh, not not licensed it's an off license use the other advantage of a disposable bronchoscope is a normal bronchoscope has got fiber optic uh, uh, fibers running down the bronchoscope so when you bend it too much the fiber snaps and when a fiber snaps you get black spots so over period of time when more inexperienced people are using a flexible bronchoscope they will end up with losing vision with each fiber because each fiber is a pixel on the screen so when the fiber disconnects or snaps then you lose the picture as compared to that this flexible bronchoscope is based on optics rather than fiber so there is a camera at the tip of the at the tip of that bronchoscope and that is relaying an image down here so there are really no fibers running down this bronchoscope so no matter how much you manipulate it you cannot snap the fibers so the image remains constant and again with the technological advances i'm pretty certain that these images will become more and more high high definition and you'll get better picture on the screen so this is a area where a lot of people are still working on and i think things are going to change quite dramatically uh so this is an ambush disposable bronchoscope uh intubating bronchoscope this is my anesthetist dr sangeeta and uh, the whole team here and the uh, intubating bronchoscope is used regularly in uh, thoracic surgery setup in my particular uh, setup uh, wherever i work no anesthetist will pass in a double lumen tube without checking with the intubating bronchoscope so it is nowadays almost mandatory it's part of guidelines which says that once you put in a double lumen tube you must check it with an intubating bronchoscope uh you must check it with an intubating bronchoscope to make sure that your uh, double lumen tube is exactly on the side that you want to particularly important when you are intubating the right side because you need to make sure that the murphy's eye is bang opposite the right upper lobe bronchus and intubating bronchoscope makes it very very uh, easy to have a look uh, this is the one i was showing you this is an optical intubating by a bronchoscope you can also have video intubating bronchoscopes where the whole image is transmitted on a screen and and it helps you to it helps everybody to see what is happening within the bronchus so what are the procedures that you can do with a simple bronchoscopy we all know simple things like biopsy so you have here is the vision channel there is a suction channel and then the, through the same channel you can actually pass in a guide wire with a forceps the forceps can go in and take multiple biopsies of course these are tiny biopsies but they are good enough to give you diagnosis and of course you don't take a single biopsy you always take multiple biopsies not just from the lesion but also from surrounding areas the reason for that is when you're dealing with lung cancer or you're dealing with somebody with a history of smoking you have to think of carcinoma in situ okay so that is why it's important to take biopsies from multiple areas of the mucosa uh in addition to that you can also when you're dealing with infective cases you can do what is called as endobronchial washings or lavage so this is a like, uh, lavage happening we are flushing in fluid and the fluid that is coming out is being sucked out and trapped into the is being trapped into a specimen uh, trap and then that specimen trap is sent for cytology it can be sent for microbiology and separately for tb culture so bronco endobronchial washings are quite a good way to pick up uh, localized pathologies which may not show up in a sputum culture or in a sputum cytology so going right up to the periphery you can pick up specific uh, lesions and it will help you to diagnose things in addition to that uh, one of the tools available on a bronchoscope is a brush and you can use this brush and the brush actually abrades the mucosa you you brush it a few times uh, going forward and backward and then pull the brush out actually usually when we do that we don't pull the brush out we pull the bronchoscope out with the brush outside because you don't want the tissue to be left behind in the channel so it's quite important that you pull the whole bronchoscope out rather than the tissue out and then whatever is there on the brush you put it on a slide and do a rapid on site examination or you send it for uh, histology cytology etc so that's one tool available to you we have what is called as a transbronchial uh, biopsy where on a bronchoscope you can actually go across the uh, tertiary and the quaternary uh, uh, bronchus 
and get into the into the tissue of the lung and take biopsies. Uh, and this can be done under CM guidance uh, or under direct uh, vision guidance. And you can get uh, biopsies from various uh, areas. Of course, the sensitivity of this uh, biopsy is much lesser than a magnetic guidance biopsy because here you are just going into the lung in a blind way and taking a biopsy. There is, of course, a risk that you might cause bleeding because you are going transbronchially into the area. So the sensitivity of TBLB is slightly lower. And nowadays, we have much better techniques than TBLB to do uh, biopsies. Uh, we have the concept of doing a transbronchial aspiration biopsy. Works pretty well for station 7, station 4, station 2 uh, lymph nodes, where you go in and you try and uh, push your needle across the carina. Usually good for, four, uh, for 10, uh, 7, and 4, if you really know exactly where you are going. But again, it's a blind procedure, so you've got to be very careful that your needle is not getting into the pulmonary artery or things like that. So nowadays, pretty much all of this is going obsolete with the onset of eBus. So very few, there are, there are still a few centers across the country where eBus is not available. They still do TBNA and it has uh, decent sensitivities and specificities, but of course not as good as eBus. So this is how you do, this is the technicality of doing an eBus. Works very well for station seven because you know that there is no major vessel there at the carina and you safely go across the carina and take your biopsies. But the important thing is it's not just one uh, needle. You've got to do multiple punctures to get multiple um, multiple samples so that your sensitivity of your procedure increases. Uh, bronchoscopic care is very important. Whenever we are using a bronchoscope, it is our device. It is very, very, very important to maintain the bronchoscope. There are various methods of cleaning available. There is pre-cleaning, mechanical cleaning, uh, disinfection, and post-processing of a bronchoscope. I won't go into technical details of all of this, but just understand that really you've got to wash out all the channels, you've got to clean out everything, and then you've got to mechanically, uh, so that's pre-cleaning, then mechanical cleaning, then it goes into a disinfectant chamber, so there is a lot of things that you need to do when uh, you have to take care of the bronchoscope. And, and particularly when the bronchoscope comes in the hands of an inexperienced person, you inadvertently, when they are manipulating the bronchoscope or when they're putting in uh, uh, probes or needles through the bronchoscope, they may actually damage the bronchoscope. And this is a classical example of a, of a damage in the sheet of the bronchoscope where there are bubbles coming out. This is called as a bubble test that you do when you put the bronchoscope under water and you, you, you watch for that uh, air coming out from the side of the bronchoscope. Your channel is straight, the air should come out from the end of the bronchoscope. Anything coming out from the side suggests that there is a damage to the uh, covering sheet of the bronchoscope. Now the problem with this damage is A, it will cause water to seep into the sheet and more importantly, it will cause bacteria to seep into the sheet, which you cannot clean off. So there is a high risk of infection, cross infection from one patient to another when you have a damage to the bronchoscope. So this has to go back to the manufacturers for repair and they have to resheat it. So quite, quite an expensive procedure. Again, whenever we use bronchoscopes, there is always a separate area which is used for cleaning the bronchoscope. There is a separate sterilizer for bronchoscope. It is a vertical hanging sterilizer where you put the bronchoscopes into. And then uh, this is another device available, which is called as automatic flexible endoscope reprocessor. So you put it all uh, properly into these channels so that they are not uh, bent too much. And then you close it and then uh, all the, uh, it gets uh, reprocessed with, uh, with the, all the various chemicals and then the bronchoscope comes out on the other side sterile. Uh, storage of the bronchoscope is very, very important. When you've done all of this cleaning, you've got to make sure that each bronchoscope has its own uh, area to be stored. And horizontal, vertical storage is better than horizontal storage. So personally, uh, in our theaters, we have vertical storage. So you hang the bronchoscope from a hook on the top. There are slots for 10 or 20 bronchoscopes and you hang each one of them so that the fiber optic cable doesn't get bent and doesn't get uh, snapped. 
So vertical storage is better than horizontal storage. So personally, I like my bronchoscopes to be stored vertically rather than horizontally. The most important thing, and particularly in this era of COVID-19, is that you are directly exposed to the respiratory system of the patient when you're doing a bronchoscopy. All the bacteria, all the cough and everything is coming and flashing into your face. I've seen a lot of, almost 95% of uh, pulmonologists and even surgeons hardly wearing any protective equipment on their face. They will wear a glove, they will wear a gown, but surprise, surprise, they do not wear goggles and they certainly do not wear a mask when they're doing bronchoscopy. So it is very, very, very important to remember that you have to take personal protection when you're dealing with bronchoscopy because 95%, at least in India, there is an exposure to tuberculosis and then you will end up getting TB and that's the last thing you want. So you've got to be very careful and particularly now with COVID-19 and patients in the ICU, you having to do bronchoscopy on these patients, it is absolutely mandatory that you do maximum personal protection, okay? All right. So that's so much so about flexible bronchoscopy. Let's look at rigid bronchoscopy. The standard one that uh, we use and a lot of people use is called as a rigid bronchoscope, Carl Stoss rigid bronchoscope. Uh, there are various uh, diameters of the Carl Stoss rigid bronchoscope, almost starting with 9 to 8.5 to 6.5 and 5.5. There are various, various ranges between it. And depending on whether it's a male or a female, or a child, uh, we calculate uh, the diameter of, expected diameter of the larynx and the trachea, and then we decide uh, which uh, bronchoscope to use. Because if you're doing an adult male, you try to use the largest size uh, diameter, which is 8.5, purely because you want to actually pass other instruments through it. If it's a straightforward diagnostic rigid bronchoscopy, it doesn't matter. But when you're doing a therapeutic rigid bronchoscopy, you want largest channel, so that your instruments can go through it. And more importantly, the ventilation is also going through the same channel. So you don't want your instruments to block the ventilation. So it is important to choose the largest possible size for, uh, for the patient, patient's height and weight. So typically, if I'm doing a rigid bronchoscopy, I actually put a flexible bronchoscope through it to do my additional procedures. So I will use 8 to 8.5 for a male. If it's a female, I'll use 7 to 7.5. And then it depends on a child. Uh, you can go up to 4.5, 5. They're all various sizes available. But of course, the vision goes down. So this is all the diameters that are available. And uh, there is an endoscopic system here. See, see where my arrow is? That's a telescope that fits into the bronchoscope. So that's a rigid bronchoscopy. But I take out this telescope. I, I leave this telescope in when I'm intubating the patient with the rigid bronchoscope. And then uh, this telescope comes out and then a flexible bronchoscope goes through it. And then I use the flexible bronchoscope to go deeper into the tissues to do a diagnostic or therapeutic, whatever else I'm doing. So the intubation is done with this rigid telescope. And then once the rigid telescope is, uh, once you're, you know, you've seen the tracheal rings, then you connect this to a jet encephalator. So my anesthetist will give me a, a lure lock. There is, if you look carefully, there is a lure lock um, here, which allows me to connect the jet encephalator. And the jet encephalator will give me, you can set it for adult or uh, pediatric settings, uh, how much uh, KPA you want to put it on. And then you give intermittent jet air ventilation. So with that, you can actually do your procedure for much longer time uh, and not have, uh, not have uh, hypoxia. Uh, remember this, when you're doing rigid bronchoscopy, you're sharing the airway with the anesthetist. So it's absolutely mandatory that you have a very good working relationship with the anesthetist. And the communication between the two is absolutely vital. The worst thing is when the, uh, the, the uh, anesthetist blows when you are using something like a laser. That's disaster because you will cause an explosion in the airway. So it's very, very, very important when to tell the anesthetist to stop ventilating. Particularly when I'm doing any diagnostic procedure and I want to biopsy, I don't want them to ventilate because that will push the blood deeper into the lung. And number two, if I'm doing laser and they ventilate, the oxygen in the air 
will cause a blast with the laser fibers. So whenever I am doing a therapeutic procedure, I will tell the anesthetist, ventilation off O double F. I use the word O double F because underneath the mask, off can sound like on when they're listening. So it's very careful. You've got to be very careful to pronounce clearly ventilation off O double F. And more importantly, don't forget to tell the anesthetist ventilation on O N. Most of the times the surgeon says ventilation off, but forgets to say ventilation on. And by the time the anesthetist starts ventilating, the saturation is down to 60%. So it is very important to stop intermittently to allow the anesthetist to uh, get the oxygenation up. And particularly when you're only looking, then the, then the anesthetist can continue the ventilation. It's only when you're doing a procedure that you want the ventilation to stop. So very, very important to use the jet encephalator in a very judicious way. Okay. Now, I put in the rigid bronchoscope and I put in a flexible bronchoscope through it and I do my procedures. One of the other techniques that are available to us for diagnosing or doing a lot of uh, diagnostic biopsies is endobronchial ultrasound. So endobronchial ultrasound is a, is a device which has got the bronchoscope in it. It has got an ultrasound element to it and it has got a working channel through which you can pass in a needle. So using the, using the ultrasound, you can actually do like an echocardiography really, but a local ultrasound. So it shows you blood vessels. It shows you flow. You can also use color dopplers to see what is the flow. Are you, have you got an artery there? Have you got a vein there? And more importantly, it highlights to you lymph nodes. It's very, very sensitive for lymph nodes. So using the ultrasound, you can actually, uh, the ultrasound uh, waves, you can actually highlight the lymph nodes. Now, the problem we all know is air is a very poor conductor of ultrasound. It's a very poor conductor of ultrasound. So in the trachea, you've got air. And if the bronchoscope was lying in the air, your um, waves would never pass across the tracheal wall into the tissue. So you've got this little balloon at the tip of it, which you inflate. And when you inflate that, then all the sound waves pass through liquid and then go across into the tissue. So you get a really good uh, orientation and uh, analysis of a lymph node or a vessel. So it is a much more safer technique than using transbronchial needles because here actually you're seeing where is the artery, where is the, uh, where is the vessel. If you do this in the uh, airway, then it's called an endobronchial ultrasound. And if you use it in the esophagus, then it is called as uh, EUS, which is esophageal ultrasound. So EUS is more or less the same like EBUS, except that it's a much larger channel uh, 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 scope because uh, obviously the esophagus can accommodate a bigger scope. Uh, the vision is all 30 degrees. Look at this vision. It's all angulated vision because you want to work on the wall, not straight on. Preferably, it's all angulated to work on the wall. And then you've got channels for biopsy, and then you've got channels for therapy. So things like uh, endobronchial, uh, endoesophageal, uh, submucosal resections and all can be done through two or three different types of uh, uh, esophagoscopes that are available. But we'll focus on the EBUS. EBUS is of two types. One is called as a convex probe EBUS. The convex probe is here. This is the convex probe. And there's a balloon, which I told you, which uh, lights up, uh, sorry, which expands. And then the sound uh, waves go across. Uh, this is very good for proximal tumors. Okay, very good for trachea, very good for uh, uh, paratracheal lymph nodes, uh, excellent for uh, subcarinal lymph nodes. Uh, can get into station 10, which are hilar lymph nodes. You can also go up to the second generation carina. So you can get 11. Uh, you can get um, uh, other, other uh, structures in that area. If there's a tumor at the hilum, you can go up to the secondary carina. And this size will allow you to do that. But beyond that, it cannot push its way further. So if it's a peripherally lying tumor beyond into the tertiary and the quaternary uh, carina, uh, tertiary and quaternary bronchi, then EBUS is, uh, a convex probe is no good. 
because the size of it restricts it. So they have now come in with a new one, which is called as a radial probe. The radial probe is a much thinner uh, bronchoscope. It's a much thinner ultrasound mechanism. And the fiber that comes out, which carries the ultrasound, is at the tip of it. And it gives out ultrasonic image at the tip. This gives out at the side. This gives out at the tip. So you can actually manipulate this bronchoscope into the tertiary and, and the quaternary carina and take a biopsy from much, much deeper using the ultrasound. So this is how we do that. You switch on this, uh, switch on, uh, sorry, inflate the balloon, switch on your ultrasound, and these are the images that you get. You can see vessel, you can see lymph nodes quite clearly. As I said, you can use Dopplers to see uh, flow through the vessel. So it gives you an idea of what exactly is happening. The gauge needle is a 22 gauge tDNA needle. Uh, the working channel is uh, a two millimeter working channel. Uh, you can insert the needle into the tissue and then apply suction. The suction will pull the tissue into the needle and then you take the whole needle back and uh, do what is called as a rose, which is rapid on-site uh, examination. So you have to go in, or in and out at least uh, five to 10 times and it takes you 20 to 30 seconds. So your yield goes up quite a lot. And then the whole sheet is removed out. The needle is removed out and put onto a slide. But the key thing is you need a really good histopathologist or a cytopathologist. The success of an EBUS program completely depends on how good is the cytopathologist. And most advanced centers actually have the cytopathologist in theater sitting in theater with his microscope, with his array of uh, uh, some stains, and he will look under the microscope as the procedure is going on, and he will tell you whether the biopsy is adequate or not adequate. If it's not adequate, you go in and take more biopsies. When you do that, your sensitivity of your uh, procedure goes up dramatically. So it is a teamwork where, where eBus is concerned. Again, I told you radial EBUS works very well for distal peripheral tumors. So here it is going all the way to the periphery in the tertiary uh, bronchi, and you can take uh, biopsies using the radial EBUS. So it's just an advancement on the technology. Uh, ESTS uh, ERS guidelines, as well as ACCP guidelines, have looked at EBUS and e EUS in a very big way, and they have suggested that it has a sensitivity of 83 to 93% a specificity of 97 to 100%. Okay, so when it comes positive on an EBUS, it is positive. The problem is when it comes negative, it does not mean that it is not cancer. So the specificity is very high. If it comes positive and you see malignant cells, then it is cancer. There is no two ways about it. There is a, also the guidelines have looked at restaging with EBUS after you've done chemotherapy, radiotherapy, downstaging, and then you restage with an EBUS. Again, the sensitivity and specificity is pretty acceptable uh, to give you an answer as to what is happening in the mediastinum and very, very good levels of accuracy. So now this has become the first choice of investigations. You have no longer any uh, role for jumping in with the media stenoscopy. If you have access to EBUS or EUS, that is the first investigative tool that you must use for staging the media stenum in lung cancer. And the level of evidence is one. Okay, so it's very important. It's no longer, uh, you know, maybe or could be, let's do media stenum. You cannot. The guidelines are very clear. I, I explained it the last time when I did the lecture on the GAR on, on uh, ESTS ERS guidelines. Okay, what are the advantages of EBUS? It's minimally invasive and pretty safe. It's pretty accurate for mediastinal staging. It can reach almost all lymph node stations. A com combination of EBUS and EUS can get you all the lymph nodes. Five and six are very difficult to get with EBUS, so EUS can get to five and six. Eight and 10, eight and nine are very difficult to get with EBUS. Um, your uh, EUS can get to eight and nine. Uh, just for your explanation, uh, two and four is paratracheals, R and L. Ten is uh, hilar. Seven is subcarinal. Eight is paraesophageal. Nine is inferior pulmonary ligament. And then on the left side, 
five and six are sub and para-aortic lymph nodes, okay? So this is just to uh, recreate for you to understand what we are talking about. It is a very good alternative for surgical staging. Mediastinoscopy has gone down quite dramatically now, but there is a definite role for mediastinoscopy. And, and if you use it more and more in staging the mediastinum, eventually it has been proven that actually EBUS is a more cost-effective uh, mechanism for treating lung cancer because it has high sensitivity and high specificity and you can very accurately decide whether the patient needs chemotherapy or surgery or a combination, whatever. The disadvantage is, of course, you use uh, white light images. Sometimes the images may be suboptimal, but that's not so much of an issue nowadays. More problem is the false negative. If you get a negative on an EBUS, it does not mean that the mediastinal lymph node is negative. So you need to go back in surgically and biopsy these lymph nodes. It's very important. Again, there is a learning curve because you're not operating straight on. Uh, with EBUS, you're operating at an angle of 30 to 45 degrees to your left. So the movement, you have to learn, the hand-eye coordination has to be learned how to move at an angle and, and get into the lymph node. It's not that easy. You really need to do a huge number of EBUS before you become good. And uh, it has a low negative predictive value. We said that. But if it is negative, then it should be followed by mediastinoscopy because you should not be operating on lung cancer without knowing what is the staging of the mediastinum. It is absolutely mandatory. And if you go to the ESTS ERS guidelines for staging the mediastinum, it is very clearly and very beautifully listed in, in an order as to what is the order of the investigations. The first step is ES, e, EBUS and or EUS. Second step is mediastinoscopy if EBUS or EUS are negative. Uh, mediastinoscopy upfront if the EBUS has given you an answer and you need more tissue. Uh, and of course, if you've done uh, induction and resection is being considered, then EBUS actually, EBUS EUS is a step. And if that's not possible, then mediastinoscopy for restaging. So these are the guidelines. This is the pathway, sorry. This is the pathway that you follow. And this uh, is, is a different lecture. This is a lecture on staging the mediastinum. And I, I've done this in the past, but I'm quite happy to repeat it with you guys uh, when we talk about uh, the mediastinum. But today we'll talk about uh, endobronchial surgery. So the next um, available tool in your hand is what is called as an autofluorescence bronchoscopy. Particularly very, very good for picking up uh, subtle changes, dysplasia. Uh, you know, in smokers, you need to know carcinoma in situ you need to know where is the dysplasia uh, occurring in these cancer cells. So there, is, uh, there are chromophores called as elastin, porphyrins, and flavins, which are given to the patient. And these chromophores, when they are exposed to the light of the, of the bronchoscope uh, at, at around 400 to 450 nanometers, they, they change a color. So respiratory mucosa is green, and then dysplasia looks distinctly reddish brown. So very clearly in front of you, you get a picture and you get an illumination which tells you where exactly to biopsy. So autofluorescence bronchoscopy is good when you're dealing with smokers, when you're dealing with early lesions, because it guides you to where to, because when you're looking down this, you don't know where to biopsy. You may see hyperemia, you may see some reddish, reddish patch, if you don't see a tumor, then you don't know where to biopsy. The moment you get into autofluorescence bronchoscopy, look at the pad. It very clearly tells you where is the dysplastic. Can you see that? So this is a different light. We've used a different light source. And look at it. Very clearly, it's telling you this is normal bronchus, normal epithelium, but this is not normal. Please biopsy here. So using autofluorescence biopsy, your sensitivity of Displace, this plastic changes goes up. And that is why this is a good technique in the hands of a good pulmonologist. Uh, it identifies precancerous lesions. It can be used for follow-up uh, of uh, cancers. It can be used for restaging of uh, tumors when they have had uh, induction uh, or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, and it can be used as a surveillance to tool for patients who have had previous surgery for cancer of the lung. Uh, there is again a learning curve, but the specificity of this is low. You definitely need more biopsies because you're looking for subtle changes. 
you're looking for microscopic changes. And then if there is more blood or if there is bleeding into that area, then you will get refraction errors because the red color absorbs away all of these uh, white light and it completely gives you a, a very distracted uh, appearance. So the cost effectiveness has not yet been uh, clarified whether autofluorescence bronchoscopy is a tool that can be used uh, as a screening tool for lung cancer. Uh, hence, um, uh, some people, a lot of people don't use autofluorescence as a routine. But in a high-end lung cancer center, you must have access to autofluorescence uh, bronchoscopy. So this is all about diagnostics. Uh, let's look at what are the therapeutic options available to us in endobronchial surgery. So the standard one, which all of you would have done probably at some time in your life or seen it, is removal of foreign bodies. And there is a whole variety of foreign bodies. Uh, people give uh, you know lectures and lectures on the type of foreign bodies which they've taken out. Uh, teeth and peanuts and God knows what. The other things are uh, for resection of benign pedunculated tumors. Uh, you can snare it via bronchoscopy uh, using a snaring and a forceps. You can use endobronchial electrocautery for uh, burning away small lesions. Uh, you can use endobronchial laser. You can use endobronchial cryotherapy as a therapeutic measure. You can use endobronchial argon plasma coagulation. And we'll talk about each one of these. I'll take you through everything. Uh, the one thing that people ask me quite often is what is the bronchoscopic management of a bronchopleural fistula? Is there any role? for endobronchial uh, treatment for a, for a bronchopleural fistula? The answer is yes. If it is a small fistula, if it's a very early fistula, then you have a scope of going through the bronchial root, identifying the fistula, and then you can actually block the fistula with various uh, devices that are available. So the easiest way is, of course, to use a blocker. So what you're doing is with a blocker, it's called a Watanabe blocker. You just block away that segment of, the, of your bronchial stump. You just block it away so that no uh, air goes across, no fluid gets into that. And it allows that small bronchopleural fistula to heal. So you're actually, you're not treating the fistula, but you're giving it time to heal by blocking away that area of the, of the, of the uh, fistula. You can actually inject the fistula with a few things. Uh, there are various things. You can use a blood patch. Uh, you can use glue. Uh, you can use tisseal. So there are various things available. Cyanoacrylate glue is used. Tisseal is used. But the important thing is when you're doing an endobronchial procedure and trying to inject glue, please, please, please make sure that you do not withdraw that catheter back into the bronchoscope. Because with glue at the tip of that uh, catheter, and you withdraw it back into the bronchoscope, the glue will block your therapeutic channel. And I promise you, your management will throw a fit. Has happened many times. I've seen a bronchoscope which costs about 15, 20 lakhs being thrown away because they, they, they pulled back the catheter into the, uh, into the working channel of the bronchoscope and that blocked off because the glue sat in the working channel. So when you do these procedures, you put in the bronchoscope, put your uh, uh, catheter through it, and then pull the bronchoscope as far away as possible. Only thing, only vision, the bronchoscope is used only for vision. And then you inject the glue, and then take both the bronchoscope and the catheter, which is lying outside, together out. You have to pull it out together. And sometimes you have to clean the tip or you have to snip the tip, and then pull it out of the working channel. So it's very important to take care that you don't damage the bronchoscope. Uh, there is uh, evidence and more and more papers coming off of use of a endobronchial valve for bronchopleural fistula. And I'll talk about that later. Uh, all you do is you block off that segment where the leak is. And uh, what you do is you allow the fistula to heal. So you don't allow the forward flow of air. And uh, whatever comes back, it's a one-way valve, so it only allows stuff to come back. So any collection there will come out, but nothing will go forward, and that will allow the fistula to heal. Uh, this is a uh, post pneumonectomy fistula. Look at this. You can see the stapling line here, and there is a nice little hole here. Um, sorry, one second. 
Again, this is a small fistula here. Again, you can see this foreign body. The problem is this fistula will never heal if these clips are here. So when you go in to do these things, you have to actually take away these clips. So what you do is you get your bronchoscope in, you take away all the foreign body that you see, you actually have to take away any sutures that are there, and then you pass a brush across the fistula. And what you try to do is you cause trauma to the mucosa. The reason why you cause trauma to the mucosa is because you want to create irregularity on the mucosa. So that when you inject the glue, the glue will set into these irregularities and will get attached to that uh, thing. Galaxy J7 next. Just switch off your phone. Switch off your microphone, please. Hello. I don't know who this is. Galaxy J7 next. I can't continue a lecture if people are talking in the background. Just please switch off your phone. Are you listening to the talk or you're not listening to the talk? Switch off your microphone, please. Thank you. It really disrupts my thought process. How the hell do I get switch off for everybody? It's on the participants, sir. Maybe you can I, I mute it all from it's there. Just, uh, it's very annoying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you push your endobronchial brush onto the mucosa. You disrupt the mucosa so that the glue sets into the mucosa. And then it stays there. Now, one of the problems with putting glue is that it forms a little plug. But when the patient coughs, the whole plug gets coughed out. So you really need to brush up that mucosa to make sure that the glue sits. Uh, it, it forms like little uh, fingers into the mucosa and then the glue sits very well. Coughing out the uh, glue plug is not a problem. But if the glue plug goes to the other side by mistake while coughing, then you will cause atelectasis on the other side. And that is a problem. So that is why you've got to be very careful that you actually brush the mucosa and then you spray the area with glue. And again, I said there are various things, cyanoacrylate glue, there is Tisseal, a uh, lot of other things. You can use autologous blood. Uh, different things have been described in literature. But uh, to be honest, the success rate of this is not very good. It works very well for very small fistulas. But very often when I've used these, uh, I have found that a few weeks down the road, the patient cuffs out the, uh, uh, the glue and then you're back to square one. But it is worth trying because the problem is the surgery to close a bronchopleural fistula is a big undertaking. So that's why you try and avoid surgery. So very tiny fistulas or small fistulas may buy you time to, to, to either the fistula close or more importantly, it will buy you time for control of infection so that the patient becomes relatively asymptomatic your antibiotics start to act so the patient is not very toxic so that when you go back and do your surgery for that fistula you may be able to get a good success so this is how you do that there is a fistula underneath that and i'm injecting the glue that glue forms a little uh, sort of blob there uh, i have uh, as you can see some blood there i have actually roughened up the mucosa and, and that's how it sits there. So it covers the uh, tiny bronchopleural fistula. And, and this is a technique that you can use sometimes to get away with uh, in, in a patient with endobronchial uh, problems, okay? Endobronchial fistulas. Uh, so what about endobronchial cautery and snaring? This is again a very easy procedure. Uh, you have the use of diathermy and you have various probes available. Uh, you can have various diameter probes or you can also have a snare uh, which can be connected to diathermy so the snare will go around the tumor and you diathermize the base of the tumor. But these things work very well when it is a pedunculated tumor, uh, a pedunculated benign tumor in the lung, in the bronchi. If, it is a, if it's a sessile tumor, which means it's got a broad base, then snaring it becomes a real problem. So it works only when, when you it works well only when you can actually get around it and you buzz your way. So as you close the snare, you activate the diathermy and the diathermy then cuts through the base 
and takes out the uh, takes out the tumor. Uh, what are the risks of uh, uh, this was a previous slide sorry what are the risks of bronchopleural fish uh, what are the risks of uh, endobronchial uh, diathermy uh, the risks of using uh, electrocautery in the in the uh, bronchus is bleeding because you as, as i showed you earlier if it's a large area and you try to diathermize you might get bleeding and and diathermy is not an accurate area uh, does not cover an accurate area so you can get bleeding you can get excessive cough uh, because there's irritation of the bronchial mucosa. Uh, sometimes you can get a fire. You can get an endobronchial. You, you, you use the diathermy and suddenly your anesthetist blows oxygen down there. Oxygen plus a spark is equal to fire. You'll actually get a blast. There are case reports uh, of blasts in the, in the airway and causing endobronchial burns in patients. So you've got to be very, very careful. Whenever you're doing any therapeutic procedure into the airway, you must tell them to switch off the ventilation. And I shout, ventilation off OFF. And then, of course, there's a risk of getting an electric shock if uh, your devices are uh, not well insulated. So these are all the problems of, uh, uh, of electrocautery. Uh, what about endobronchial balloon dilatation? That is also a system that's available to us. You can use a manometry catheter or you can use an esophageal balloon. There are special endobronchial balloons available for uh, bronchial stenosis, for tracheal stenosis, which you can uh, go, go in and inject. You can use uh, hydrostatic pressure. You can set the pressure and decide how, how much you want to do. The problem with this technique is you have to do repeated dilatations, uh, but uh, usually these things come back. Whatever you do, you know, this is good for webs and things like that but not so good for stenosis. So if you've got uh, small problems, uh, dilatation works very well. Uh, or you've done a tracheal resection and following tracheal resection, you've got a mild stenosis, you can use dilatation. But it never works very well for uh, major stenosis or fibrotic diseases. And um, not a great idea to, uh, you know, you really have to repeat the dilatations over a period of time. Sometimes we use the endobronchial balloons for opening up stents. So after we have gone in and we have put in a, uh, we have taken away endobronchial tumor and then we have deployed a stent, we pass in a balloon dilator through it and we open up the balloon to allow the stent to open up to its maximum capacity. And it helps push the tissue out so that the airway opens up a bit more. So there are various uh, indications, but remember, most of the times there's recurrence of the pathology and you might have to do repeated procedures or end up doing uh, something more than uh, just balloon dilatation. So let's look at lasering. That's another important aspect. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, a lot of the lasering side of things. It is part of the ACCP guidelines, part of the BTS guidelines, okay? Use of uh, relief of obstruction for intraluminal tumor because of terminal malignancy is actually part of the guidelines. And laser particularly has been mentioned in both the guidelines, ND YAG laser, okay? So anytime you use laser, remember you are using the guidelines to treat. Most of the times it's palliative, sometimes it is uh, therapeutic. So let's talk about laser. Uh, laser is, is an acronym, L-A-S-E-R, stands for light, amplification by simulated emission of radiation. So it's not stimulated, it's simulated. So it's amplification of the light by simulation of the radiation that happens. So, the, so you've got this spectrum of light in nanometers and the lasers that are available are from CO2 all the way to excimer, uh, excimer uh, lasers. You don't need to know the physics must much except to understand that it is all uh, the various uh, wavelengths of light, it changes. So the type of laser that you uh, are using is actually at a different wavelength. Hence the property of the laser changes depending upon what is the, uh, what is the light zone that you're dealing with, the light spectrum that you're dealing with, okay? So here you are, all these lasers. This is straight from a paper, very, very good paper, very well written, uh, talking about endobronchial photoresections. And it talks about all the types of lasers that are available from argon to CO2. 
talks about the wavelengths. If you want to know, you can copy this and uh, say it. And more important is here, what is the depth of penetration, okay? So CO2 has a low depth of penetration, so very good for surface lesions. And then you've got uh, NDAG is the one that we commonly use. And NDAG has a depth of penetration of 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters. But the balance is between perforation and uh, therapy. So it's important to remember that if you're going to be using a, a laser which, perfor which goes deep into the tissue, and burns out the cancer, then you have a high risk of perforation. It's very important to remember this. As opposed to that, the CO2 laser is only superficial. So the ENT guys in the uh, oropharyngeal airway use CO2 quite a lot. They, they, they are very happy with uh, that, this laser because there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, sensitive things, deeper structures. Uh, we, as thoracic surgeons, use NDAG. This is our... Uh, a preferred mode of uh, of uh, of using laser. Again, it has got a decent coagulating effect, but not so great cutting effect. Whereas CO2 laser has little coagulating effect, but pretty decent cutting effect. So when you're taking out oropharyngeal cancers, you want to cut it and slice it from the base. Uh, for, whereas we want to uh, burn back the tumor. So our indication is NDAG rather than uh, this thing. Uh, again, I'm sorry about this, uh, this headline, that's a mistake. So why do we use lasers? What are the three qualities of the laser? There are three qualities which are very important for a laser. One is the monochromacity, uh, one is the coherence, and one is the collimation. Monochromacity means that whenever you use laser beams, all photons are with the same wavelength. There is no fluctuation of the intensity of the laser. So along the pathway of the laser, all photons have the same wavelength. So you cannot start with CO2 and end up with NDAG or argon at the other end. They all stay CO2. We sh I showed you the light spectrum. So all the photons stay at the same spectrum from the start to the end. The other thing is the, the, uh, the rays of the light that come out are parallel to each other to infinity. So they can stay parallel to each other for as long as the rays can keep going. And more importantly, the collimation means there is no loss of energy over distance. So when you start at one point from the machine, which creates the laser, the, the energy that is created at the machine is the same energy that will come at the tip of the fiber. This way you can actually calculate how much energy you're giving. So the safety of the device goes up dramatically. It doesn't happen that you are setting the machine at 40 and there's only four coming at the tip, okay? So collimation is a very important tool for us when we are burning back, uh, device, burning back uh, uh, tumors. Uh, this is the paper, again, from uh, Kopen Wang, who talks about it, and it's a very, very good uh, understanding of why you use lasers. Uh, whenever laser light hits the surface, very little gets reflected back. There is some reflection, but very little. But predominantly, most of it gets transmitted across. So most of the things about laser gets transmitted to the tissue. In addition to that, there is a few scatter waves. And the moment it gets transmitted, it gets absorbed. And when it gets absorbed, there is either heat formation, which burns the tissue or it, it, it activates a certain chemical uh, reagents and reaction within the tumor cell uh, and, and it causes what is called as photoablation. It also changes the ionic state of the DNAs and it can actually kill the cancer cell at an ionic level. So there are few pathophysiologies of how a laser acts. This is a CO2 beam laser we said it can only go to a very small uh, depth, not 0.3, whereas NDEAG can go all the way to the tip. But the burning pattern of the two lasers is different. So the CO2, because it only comes to the tip, there is this burning pattern, whereas an argon goes slightly deeper and there is always a zone outside of it, of, of its uh, burning pattern. And again, an NDEAG creates a longitudinal zone of, uh, of action, of energy, and there is always a surrounding zone. So you've got to take care of the surrounding zone. It's very important. 
is not just about buzzing the tumor here. You've got to remember that there will be some burn out uh, to the lateral sides because of the scatter waves. So because the tissue gets, uh, the energy gets scattered, the burn can go to laterally and that is what causes damage to surrounding structures. So you have to understand the pathophysiology of each laser before, uh, the physics of each laser before using it on cancer. Uh, lasers versus uh, stents versus brachytherapy, pretty good for endoluminal obstruction, but not great for extraluminal obstruction. And sometimes if there's a mixed obstruction, it's good for the endoluminal part of it. So lasers work very well only for endoluminal obstructions, not for uh, extraluminal obstructions. Um, so again, oh, come on, what's happening? Okay, so again, we've got uh, NDAG laser. These are the features of NDAG laser. It's quite important. We use it predominantly in the trachea or the main bronchi. Uh, very good for endobronchial lesions, for exophytic, means tumors which are falling out into the lumen. Very good for localized lesions, less than four centimeters. So uh, lasers, whenever you use, there's a Mathers rule of four, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Uh, works very well uh, for visible distal lumen. If it's completely blocked, then it's very difficult because you don't know what the hell is happening beyond the tumor. Uh, works well for early collapse. So if the collapse is less than four to six weeks, it works very well. Uh, if it's a stable patient, uh, always the FiO2 requirement shouldn't, uh, should be around 40%. Um, coagulation profile has to be normal because bleeding is an issue and the pulmonary vascular supply has to be intact, okay? So these are some factors. You can take a snapshot of the screen and whenever anybody asks you about NDAG laser, just throw this out. These are all self-explanatory. I don't need to go into details of each of these points. Uh, I told you about Mathers rule of four. This is very good. In the exam, if you can reproduce this, I'll be very, very happy. This is the one that you have to reproduce, okay? So usually maximum length of lesion, four centimeters, duration of lung collapse, less than four weeks, life expectancy greater than four weeks. You don't want to laser somebody who's going to die tomorrow, okay? Uh, procedure time should not be very long, so less than four hours. FiO2 during laser therapy should be less than 40%. Don't raise the FiO2, you will cause laser burns. Uh, number of pulses between clean should be less than 40. Uh, total number of repeat treatment should be less than four, at least four people on the laser teams. But more important is these settings. 40 watts, four watts. If it's a non-contact laser, that means you're doing it from a distance, then 40 watts. If it's a contact laser, like a CO2 laser, <coughs> then four watts. Pulse duration of the laser should be 0.4 seconds, okay? Again, distance-wise, endobronchial tube lesion to around four centimeters. The fiber tip to lesion should be four millimeters and fiber flexible bronchoscope to the tip should be four millimeters. Same point he's making here that please do not keep the fiber tip close to the bronchoscope. You'll burn the bronchoscope. So pull the bronchoscope back at least. The minimum distance is four millimeters. In fact, most of us keep it at a centimeter away or two centimeters away because the last thing I want is the razor to reflect back on the bronchoscope and burn the bronchoscope. So this is a good one. Um, again, take a snapshot of this. We will ask you in the exam, particularly if I give you a laser fiber, I might ask you some of these. And the one important point is these settings. I will ask you these settings. So you must remember what are the settings of a laser, okay? Again, self-explanatory. Now the next question, which comes actually as a question in the exam, uh, comes as MCQs, comes as long question in the exams. What are safety factors for lasers? Very, very important. This does come in the exam. We always ask uh, when we are talking about a uh, endobronchial lasering. Most important thing, nobody, nobody in a laser theater can enter if he has not done the laser safety course. You have to be certified and this course has to be renewed every two years. It's mandatory. You cannot even touch a laser machine if you are not laser safety certified. You cannot even be a cleaner in a laser theater if you don't know the safety uh, certification of laser. Very important, okay? The other thing is there should be eye protection for all lasers, uh, for all personnel. The last thing you want is laser to reflect off a surface and hit your eye because you know that laser causes retin retinal damage. 
So nobody should be in theater, no matter how far, no matter how close. It's not just about the theater, about the surgeon and the anesthetist. Everybody in theater should have safety precautions, should be wearing the goggles. There should be no reflective material. So even the rigid bronchoscope that we use for laser is actually black colored. It's not silver colored that you have a normal rigid bronchoscope. The laser rigid bronchoscope through which we put in the flexible is actually black colored so that no light hits the silver and reflects into the eye of the uh, operator. So no reflective material. All the uh, windows and all the glass surfaces are covered with a, with a sheet. There is a, usually a, a roller. We, in, in our theaters, we have roller shutters. So the roller shutters come down and all glass surfaces are covered. Anesthetic trolley is also covered to make sure there is no reflective material in the theater, okay? So laser can be done only in specialized laser theaters where all the stuff is available to protect all the covers. Uh, and most importantly, laser warning sign has to be there uh, in theater. Not just in theater, but also outside theater. So there is always a sign at the top and whenever laser switches on, the moment I'm firing a laser, those lights go up. So nobody can accidentally enter into the theater. In fact, the moment we are in theater and all the staff is in, we lock the door. We do not allow anybody to enter the theater because accidentally, A, I don't want to be distracted by somebody walking into my theater, particularly when I'm firing laser. And B, I don't want somebody to walk in without protective glasses because they will get uh, laser injury and that is, that's a disaster to happen. So all windows are covered. Nobody can peep into the theater. You know, the theater doors have these little windows. Those are the ones that specifically need to be covered because people peep into there to see what's happening uh, in the theater. And minimum personnel, as I said, uh, four personnel is what you want in theater, as little as possible. So minimum is four. Uh, you've got to make sure that the patient is also protected, okay? You don't think that just your uh, protection is important. The patient can also get eye injury with the laser. So we always, 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 the moment he's under anesthesia, we close the eyes, we tape the eyes, and then we put wet gauze, not dry gauze, because dry gauze will catch fire. If the laser hits it and it heats up, it can catch fire. So we wet the gauze, we put the wet gauze on the eyes, and then we put, like swimming goggles, we put goggles, there are laser goggles for the patient. So patient is also put, though he is under anesthesia, you still put, laser goggles on the patient. Uh, but you don't use those big ones that the surgeon uses. You use a like a swimming goggle that you put on the head of the patient. So the patient has to be uh, protected as well. A non-reflective bronchoscope is uh, natural. Uh, we have two suctions on, on a laser set. One suction is for sucking at the tip of your bronchoscope. Okay, so one suction connection comes to sucking endobronchially all the secretions and everything else. But more importantly, at the proximal end of the bronchoscope, the rigid bronchoscope, we have two large uh, cups which are placed next to the uh, proximal end of the rigid bronchoscope to suck out the laser plume because the, the, the fumes that are formed by the burning, they are known to be carcinogenic. And the last thing you want is you as a surgeon to be inhaling that plume and then having cancer 10 years down the road. So you have to take care of that. So you need a, a special suction for the laser plume. Plume means the smoke that comes out of the bronchoscope when you're doing that. And the most important thing, this is the most vital thing. No, there is actually a key on the laser, okay, on the machine. And until and I, uh, unless I say ventilation of OFF, Theater personnel will not turn on the key. Most protective method that you should use. So when you turn on the key, that is the only time that you can fire the laser. So before you can press the foot pedal as much as you like, the laser will not fire because the key is off. The moment I say ventilation off OFF, and the anesthetist has to tell me back ventilation off OFF. Until and unless the anesthetist tells me that the ventilation is off, that key will not go on. And then I will be able to fire. So very, very important because if you push in a jet 
of oxygen when you are about to fire the laser you will cause an explosion within the chest and that's a complete complete disaster there are papers out there which have been published where they have lost the patient because of endobronchial burns as the worst thing to happen okay so there is always a safety switch on the laser and you never turn it on till the ventilation is off and you never you never switch it back off till the ventilation is back on so ventilation doesn't come on until and unless that safety switch is turned to off so very important it is all a teamwork so your surrounding team also has to know exactly what to do when you're using a uh, laser and the most important philosophy of laser is to use the minimum strength that is required for the most minimum duration for coagulating a laser don't use higher strength always start with lower strength start with four and then see how you're going and gradually increase it if you need to burn more okay always and don't do a prolonged press of the foot pedal you must just do you know recurrent presses so buzz 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 like using a diathermy but sometimes diathermy we press for a prolonged period in laser you cannot do that you got to do step by step so that you do not burn off the uh, or or cause uh, endobronchial problems so this is how a laser machine looks like and this is where the key is there is a key installed into the machine and different machines have it in different places but always it is in the front of the machine and you that is the safety switch you cannot switch the laser on till the ventilation is off and this is a laser fiber that we use and in the exam we'll give you this laser fiber and then the discussion starts okay so we used to always keep this in our examination and whenever i wanted to talk about lasers i would give it to the candidate and he would hold the fiber and then i would ask questions about it now these fibers are usually uh, meant for uh, single patient use i'm not talking about single use i'm talking about single patient use so if you want to use this fiber on a patient for three or four sessions then you put in the laser use the laser take it out clean it up put it in a pack get it sterilized but on the top of that you write the patient's name because he will come back you know 3 days later one week later for a second session you don't have to open the laser a new laser fiber you can actually use the same laser fiber for a few settings okay so that's the way you save uh, yeah, money or and cost on the laser so ndag is the most common laser use uh, it causes tissue vaporization and thermal necrosis of tumors uh we always snail and cautery debride as much as possible so we try to reduce the volume of the exophytic tumor uh and then we do the lasering to stop the bleeding and to burn the tissue back and it's not just on table in fact the burn back happens over the next 2 3 4 days so it the patient starts to feel better over a period of time as the action of the thermal vaporization and tissue necrosis goes on for 48 to 72 hours so the tumor will burn back over a period of time not just on table uh, we can retreat the patient 2 to 4 days post procedure for a second sitting if you need uh, all tumor types you really don't decide on what tumor you want to burn you can burn whatever you like with a laser laser is not dependent on the histology of the tumor uh, and you can go up to any location uh, within the airway i'm not talking about the far away uh, peripheral things i'm talking about the proximal right main bronchus left main bronchus and the uh, trachea and exophytic is usually more successful extrinsic compression usually doesn't work and most of the times when we do lasers we actually combine laser plus stenting so i will use rigid bronchoscope i'll put in a flexible bronchoscope through it or i will use my rigid bronchoscope with forceps i will try and nibble out as much as possible once i've nibbled out enough then i'll put in the labor laser i'll burn out as much as possible right to the periphery and then once i know that there is enough space there i will then fire a stent and the stent opens up and applies compression to a tissue which is already having thermal necrosis going on so over a period of time the stent gradually opens up and uh, allows the patient to breathe more safely uh relatively effective and safe of course there are complications uh, you can burn through uh the uh, tissue you can cause holes in the airways 
uh, perforations are there, but it all depends on experienced operator. You really need to know what is your uh, limits of using the laser. And it only comes with experience. And of course, the risk of bleeding. But laser actually can be used to stop the bleeding. So the, the, it's, it's sort of a, a catch-22. There is uh, 10 commandments of safe laser usage. This is quite important. Take a screenshot of this, please. And when you write a, a theory paper, please write this in the theory paper. Uh, it talks about anatomical danger zone, talks about laser team, patient selection, uh, rigid bronchoscopy, uh, monitoring the patient, talks about firing the beam in parallel to the wall. Don't direct it into the wall, but direct it parallel to the wall. Talks about the settings of the laser. Uh, talks about what to do when bleeding happens. Don't ignore it. And terminate each procedure uh, once you're happy. But make sure that when you have finished the laser, you must do endobronchial suction of the distal area so that you suck out all that uh, secretion that is accumulated beyond the tumor. And more importantly, you suck out all the debris. And of course, you have to keep the patient into a recovery room. This is the answer we want in an exam when we want you to write about laser. So uh, the DNB guys in India, please make sure you take a screenshot of this, okay? Because uh, FRCS doesn't have uh, uh, long theory questions, but uh, DNB does have. And, and so this is what you have to write. This is Dumont's and the paper is here. This is the paper that you're quoting. So you can safely quote this paper and in this paper, Dumont has given these commandments, okay? Complications we spoke about, all of this is possible, any of this is possible, and, and you've got to deal with the complication as it happens. Uh, I spoke about laser plume and other things, and most importantly is a risk of injury to healthcare personnel, okay? So this is how a laser looks. Here's a tumor and you're buzzing it and you're trying to keep it back. Here is a tumor, you're buzzing it and trying to keep it back. Uh, sometimes laser can be used for uh, webs, uh, so you can use the laser to make cuts into the webs and it opens up the web or you can now pass a, a balloon, endoscopic balloon and open it up after you've cut it with the laser. So various, you can combine more than one technique to actually achieve the best results uh, in, the, in the patient. So what about endobronchial stenting? Because laser and stenting is usually a part of the same pathology. I will just immediately jump into it. Uh, you have tracheal and bronchial stenting. Uh, what you do is you put in a rigid bronchoscope, as I explained earlier. Uh, almost all the time, I want jet encephalation for oxygenation of the patient. Uh, I have a very good discussion with my anesthetist. We both know what to do. And then I put in a flexible bronchoscope through the rigid bronchoscope. First, I will biopsy. I'll do whatever is needed to understand what is the pathology. And then I will laser that area. So NDEAG, holmium, whatever is available. I'll do hemostasis with the local adrenaline wash. So I use saline with dilute adrenaline and I can wash that area. It causes vasoconstriction. But remember, ad adrenaline can get uh, systemically absorbed pretty quickly through the bronchial mucosa. So make sure it's very, very dilute. And then I will fire the stent. Depending upon where is the pathology, I decide what is the size of the stent I need and what is the type of the stent I need. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So there are various stents that are available to you. And this is what it is. So you've got silicone stents. Look on the third column, the construction. So you've got silicone stents. You've got uh, metal stents. And you have got nitinol stents. Okay? These are the three main types of stents. So nitinol, metal, and silicone. These are the three main types. There are various sizes available all the way from nine by 20. Uh, nine is the diameter, 20 is the length of the stent. Uh, you can have all the way up to 18 by 70, depending upon where you are going to use this, okay? So you can have tracheal stents, you can have endobronchial stents. Again, the length, uh, you can you usually try and start off, if you're using a silicone one, you can actually shorten it to size. So you can open a bigger one and you can actually cut the silicone stand and uh, use it for sizing. So you really need to know the length of the area that you need to cover. Uh, you must have a proximal landing zone. You must have a distal landing zone before you put in a stand. So you've got to calculate that either by specific uh, measurements on, on uh, endobronchially by using a long catheter, uh, touching it to the distal end and pulling it back and then finding out what was the proximal extent and measuring the distance between the two points. 
or you can use uh, fluoroscopy. And under fluoroscopy, you can pass the catheter distal to the distal landing site and then pull back the catheter. And that will give you a measurement of what is the length of the stent that you want to use. Uh, there are various types of stents. There are covered stents and there are uncovered stents. Covered stents work very well when you've got endobronchial tumor and you don't want tumor to grow through the uh, mesh of the, of the stent. So it works very well for the trachea, uh, works well for proximal main bronchus, but not so good when the tumor is distally beyond because then you will block off one of the branches. So particularly in the right main bronchus, if your stent is going across uh, into the bronchus intermediates, you really need to make sure that the right upper lobe bronchus is still patent. And if you pa pass a covered stent into the right main bronchus, ending into the uh, bronchus intermediates, the right upper lobe will get knocked off. So that's why in those situations, you use an uncovered stent. Or particularly when you're going further up into the bronchi, where there are a lot more bifurcations, you prefer to use an uncovered stent rather than a covered stent. So covered stent is all for proximal uh, malignancies rather than uh, distal malignancies. The problem with using uncovered stent in a proximal malignancy is that the tumor grows within the, uh, within the network of that stent. And then if you ever have to remove this stent, it becomes a nightmare because the stent becomes a part of the body and, and it's a disaster actually. So that's why we use covered stents when we're talking about proximal obstructions. Uh, stents are also classified as tracheal and bronchial. So depending on where you're using, or they can be tracheobronchial. Sometimes you use a stent with an arm going into the left main bronchus. That's called as a tracheobronchial stent. You can also use what is called as a Y stent where the Y lies on the carina. So you cover the trachea and you cover the right main and the left main bronchus. Uh, or as I said, you can use a tracheobronchial stent by cutting off one arm of the Y and just pushing the stent into the affected side. Uh, but there are also pre-determined uh, uh, tracheobronchial stents available, which are already made either for the right side or the left side. Obviously, the right side tracheobronchial stent has an opening for the right upper lobe. But it's very difficult to get the positioning correct so that the opening covers the right upper lobe. You need great experience to be able to correctly position the stand. So this is a silicon stand, typical one. With the, it has always got these little struts on the side, and the struts help to hold it against the uh, against the uh, wall of the trachea or wall of the bronchus. Always better to oversize the stand because if you oversize it slightly, then it's hits against the wall and stays there. If you undersize it, then it will migrate distally. So not a good idea. Always try to slightly oversize the stent and uh, work it. So this is a nitinol stent. And I told you, this is a mesh. This is an uncovered nitinol stent. And tumor can grow within this uh, mesh and cause uh, ingrowing of the, of the stent. So tumor ingrowth is a real problem. Uh, but if it happens, you can also you can laser back the tumor. It's not a problem. So if suppose by chance you've used an uncovered stand, a nitinol stand, and the patient comes back with recurrent uh, tumor, which is again causing obstruction, you can go in and use laser safely on this stand. It's not a problem with a nitinol stand. You don't have an issue of the nitinol burning off. You can actually safely uh, use um, a laser to burn off, or you can put in an endobronchial balloon and open up the endobronchial balloon to push the tumor out. So there are various techniques available which you can use. Uh, I won't go into details of each technique. Uh, it really depends on your own experience, but most of us use rigid bronchoscope. We put in a flexible bronchoscope and through the flexible bronchoscope, we will uh, first pass it beyond the tumor. We will suction everything out to make sure everything is clean. We will wash and toilet. And uh, whenever I do a, uh, uh, stenting, I always want the patient to be extubated on table. Very, very, very important. Sorry, this is post, uh, post procedure. So once I put in the stent, I will pass the bronchoscope beyond the tumor. I will always make sure I suck out everything distally before I extubate the patient on table. This is how I would do it. This is a tumor, endobronchial tumor present there. I have put in a rigid bronchoscope and with the rigid bronchoscope, you pour out. So very often, purely by using a rigid bronchoscope, you can actually try to 
dilate that uh, dilate that uh, tumor or core out the tumor and then use a mechanical grasping forceps to nibble out as much as you can uh, once you have done a bit of that then you can laser the whole thing because with laser you really need to know what's happening distal it is very difficult to laser when you don't know what's happening distal that's why before lasering i prefer to do uh, you know nibbling and trying to bring out as much as possible uh, then once you've lasered you do some more decoring you take all the tissue out suction all that uh, rubbish that's coming in then you pass in a guide wire into the distal uh, airway and over the guide wire you pass in uh, your uh, stent which is carried on a on a sheet now it depends on what stent you're using uh, usually enclosed within a sheet sheet is a nitinol stent and uh, um, a silicon stent comes enclosed within a metallic tube and you push the metallic tube into that area and then you push the stent out with a with a with a trocar and an obturator so the silicon stent will open up like that whereas a nitinol stent comes prepacked within a within a catheter and as you go in with the catheter you actually pull back your rigid bronchoscope and you start deploying the stent and the stent open up in front of your eyes again if you are not happy with the deploy you can always with the nitinol stents you have the ability there is a purse string at the proximal end you can actually catch the purse string and what the purse string does is it collapses the stent a little bit and you can pull it back or push it uh, forward by holding with your rigid bronchoscope forceps at the distal end so it's possible to reposition the nitinol stent on table with silicon stent you can actually take out the stent it's not a problem if you are not happy with the position you just pull it out and take it out and you can redeploy it onto a metallic tube there is a setup on which you can just push it into the metallic tube and then redeploy it the problem with this nitinol is that you cannot redeploy it once it is there you can only move it proximally forward or backward a little bit you cannot push it back into the catheter once it's deployed is deployed otherwise it's wasted then you have to open another nitinol uh, stent and these are expensive business so you got to be careful you know exactly where you are two ways to do it one is you do it under direct vision with the bronchoscope and the flexible bronchoscope you deploy the catheter under vision the other way that some people do it they use fluoroscopy so they they use fluoroscopy and they mark out on the chest wall the area or the length of the uh, thing and they put uh, pins uh, proximal and distal and then using fluoroscopic guidance they will actually open or deploy the stent to allow it to uh, take care of that uh, take care of the of the obstruction okay is this clear hello yes sir yes sir did it make this sense what i said i'm talking is, fast because there yes, are a lot sir. of things to cover but this is quite straightforward that's why it's not complicated i'm trying to keep it simple okay so far so good that's why i've not got videos in and things like that i want to actually cover explain to you what happens okay let's look at endobronchial cryotherapy that's another technology that's available to you for uh, physically burning back uh, tumors uh, this is how the probe looks here is your machine here is your cylinder of uh, either nitric oxide or co2 and then this is a machine on which you connect these are the various catheters that are available you have flexible catheters and you have rigid catheters okay uh, so cryoprobes can be flexible or rigid uh, you use compressed gas uh, which is usually nitrous oxide or co2 okay and the uh, gas is actually pressurized <clears throat> in the in the chambers and there is an inner channel and there is an outer channel so the pressurized gas is made to pass through the inner channel and the moment it comes to the tip of the uh, of the probe it expands because the channel is narrow and then when it goes outside it expands and any gas that expands cools that is called as the joule thomson's effect okay so any gas under pressure when it goes from one narrow channel to an open space and expands it dramatically drops the temperature and using that effect you create an ice and then the cold gas gets sucked back by an external channel and i'll show you this in a minute so this is how it is here is the internal channel and the internal channel goes here is the compressed gas coming from the cylinder it's coming out the moment it comes out it has space 
it starts to expand. The moment it expands, it freezes. The temperature drops almost down to minus 89 or 90, okay? Uh, usually at the tip of the probe is cold. Uh, at the distal area, the temperature gradually dissipates, okay? And the gas, whatever is finished, it goes back, gets sucked back by an external catheter. So at the tip of your uh, probe, you will get this ice ball. And the ice ball causes the cryoablation of the tumor. You can also use this technology for taking tissue biopsies. So you can actually ice ball one area, then go ice ball the next area, and the tissue between it will get trapped on the surface of the catheter, and then you pull the whole bronchoscope out along with the tip outside. And whatever tissue is here will then give you a cryobiopsy. That is the philosophy of how cryobiopsy is done. These are the various probes that are available. The principle is not indicated for uh, immediate debulking. So laser, immediately you can debulk. You know, if a patient is acutely unwell, uh, you know, you really want to get the airway open. Laser works very well, but cryo doesn't work very well in that situation because it works on, on uh, regression of the tumor over a period of time. So it takes a week or 10 days for the tumor to slowly burn back and get necro necrosed and get open up the area. So it, it depends on the vascularity of the tumor. Usually better vascularized tumor regress better with cryotherapy. If it's more necrotic tissue, that's not so good for uh, cryotherapy. Works very well for uh, microinvasion and in situ tumors. Uh, there is no combustion risk with this. So that's a huge benefit. There is no risk of uh, fire. So just cold is the one that you use. And it's a mobile unit. So you can move the unit from A to B. It's very easy to uh, go from theater to theater. The laser needs a whole setup, needs a dedicated theater for you to actually operate in. Uh, it causes devitalization, hence causes the recanalization, and can also be used for endobronchial biopsy. And now there are new probes which can actually go across the bronchus and can be used for transbronchial biopsy. So cryotherapy is a good technique for using for biopsy. More and more pulmonologists are doing this nowadays. Uh, it can have a frontal freeze, so it can freeze in front of it, or it can have a lateral freeze uh, or a tangential freeze. So the freeze can, this is the ice ball that is being formed and the tumor will start to die with the ice ball uh, over a period of time, okay? And sometimes you can also use a fluoroscopy, particularly when you're doing transbronchial biopsies. Uh, the pulmonologists like to use fluoroscopy to guide um, where you are, to make sure that you're actually not in the pleura. The last thing you want is a pneumothorax. So you want to make sure that you're only within the parenchyma of the lung and not in the pleura. Advantages are there's better control of depth, okay? Because this is a slow process. Slowly it goes, uh, it, it burns off. Uh, it can be used in area of coated stents as well. Uh, the, the, um, the laser in a coated stent has a risk of causing fire because the coating may actually burn off, uh, whereas uh, cryotherapy is okay in a coated stent. It doesn't matter. Uh, it does not harm cartilage. That's the other thing. Laser can burn cartilage. It is less expensive than a laser. Uh, around 7,000 pounds is the, is the equipment that you need for setting up a cryotherapy program. Uh, it has got decent penetration. It can go deep into the tissue. There is no smoke, no plume. That is important, no carcinogenic uh, tissue. Uh, there is fixation of the liquids and tissues. So it depends on the type of tumor that you're dealing with. And most importantly, it can be used safely in cardiac pacemakers. Electrocautery cannot be used in cardiac pacemakers. Laser is, uh, is neither, we're not sure about laser in cardiac pacemakers. Again, I'm very careful when I'm using lasers in cardiac pacemakers. But cryotherapy can be safely used in cardiac pacemakers. There is no combustion risk with a cryotherapy. And again, I said it's a mobile unit. Okay, so that's so much so about cryotherapy. Let's look at another form of treatment that, you have available, that is available to you. It's called as uh, argon plasma coagulation, APC. And if you remember carefully from your previous slide, the APC, the argon has very, it, it's very good for superficial burning of tissue and can work from a distance. So this is the machine that's available. Uh, and these are the various probes. You've got different types of tips available. 
for using APC, and this is the philosophy. It, it, it usually works for very good for coagulation. It doesn't have that much of a cutting effect, but it has more of a coagulation effect. And argon is very, very good for stopping bleeding. So whenever you've got the hemoptysis or things like that, in liver surgery, argon is used usually, argon diathermy is used because you're cutting through the liver, you've got a large raw surface, you want to actually coagulate as you're cutting. So it works very, very well. And it's usually used from a distance. So you don't need to touch the tissue. So really, it's much more safer than using a laser. Uh, as I said, there are various probes. There are rigid probes. There are flexible probes. Completely depends on what you're doing and what is your option. Uh, good for hemostasis. Allows you to re-canalize a blocked airway. It's a non-contact technique. So you do it from a distance. Superficial, uh, it doesn't go deep into the tissue. So pretty good for uh, palliative of, of an obstructive area. And you get a broad surface coagulation. With laser, you get pinpoint surface coagulation. Uh, with the APC, you get broad area. You can cover a very large area with this, even without worrying about it. Uh, so here is the various ablative procedures. Electrocautery, tissue contact is needed. Laser, you don't need a tissue contact. APC, you don't need a tissue contact. With cryotherapy, you need a tissue contact. You have to touch the tissue for that uh, ice ball to touch the thing. And then variable depth uh, up to one centimeter, uh, but APC and cryotherapy are all superficials. So work very well for superficial uh, tumors and for superficial hemostasis, particularly when you're for hemoptysis. Uh, Electrocautery is not very good because you cannot control how deep you're going. Uh, because you're touching, you may actually burn through the airway and cause a pneumomediastinum or a pneumothorax. So that's so much so about burning techniques. Is it okay? Hello? Yes, sir. Making sense? Quite yes, straightforward. Sir. Nothing yes, complicated. Sir. It's just knowing about these techniques, okay? So one more technology is available to you. That's called as endobronchial thermoplasty. Uh, it's used for treatment of asthma. Uh, usually used for treatment of chronic asthma. There's a lot of data now coming who's talking about uh, bronchial thermoplasty for asthma. Uh, they use RFA energy. So it's, it's a probe which has got RFA attached to it. The airway distal to the main bronchus. So it usually works on the smaller peripheral airways, uh, almost up to three millimeters. So you can really go peripherally and burn things. Uh, you can create a high temperature because of the RF things. And the high temperature disrupts the muscle. You're actually trying to disrupt the myosin function and you want to relax the smooth muscle. That's what it is. It's for asthma. You don't want uh, bronco, uh, bronchospasm. And, and so it is used for as a therapeutic means for people who are being medically refractory, uh, people who are uh, progressing on uh, the amount of medical treatment that is going on, or people who are not doing well on medical treatment. Uh, bronchothermoplasty is now being touted as, as, as a new tool for uh, relief of asthma. But it doesn't give you uh, huge long-term results. At the moment, the data is still very early. And this is how you do it. You get in the catheter into the disc thing. You put in a guide wire and the guide wire opens up. There are four prongs. One, two, three, and four. Can you see that? There's no tissue between it. And these four prongs uh, create an RFA mode. And the RFA mode burns four. So you're not doing a circular burn. You're doing uh, four separate burns into the smooth muscle. So what you're causing is a disruption of the smooth muscle. Can you see that? These are all various probes and they cause vertical burns rather than horizontal burns. So there is no risk of stricture formation. So you're not doing a continuous circular burn. You're actually doing vertical burns. And then over a period of time, you follow them up with repeat bronchoscopies and things like that. Okay. Uh, what about bronchoscopic ablations of peripheral lung tumors? So far, we've spoken about proximal lung tumors. Uh, you know, what we can do for proximal lung tumors. This is a good paper. Um, uh, JTD has published it 2019. So it's a pretty recent tumor paper. And it tells you what to do when you have got tumors in the periphery. How do you tackle with tumors in the periphery? So you can use RFA ablation for tumors in the periphery, either a transdermal ablation or a transbronchial ablation. Uh, you can do photodynamic therapy. You can use EMN waves to burn these peripheral tumors. You can use thermal vapor ablation endobronchially. 
uh, or you can do this new technique called as bronchoscopic laser interstitial thermal therapy. So far, we spoke about laser endobronchially, endoluminally. But here, they are talking about using the laser for burning the parenchyma of the lung in the distal periphery. Okay, so this is a new technology. B BLIT, it's called a B-L-I-T-T. Uh, and, and some people may ask you about it. So we spoke about the other, let's speak about uh, endobronchial vapor therapy. How does that work? This is the machine that's available. This is a catheter that's available. Goes down your standard uh, bronchoscope. And actually, uh, it creates, uh, you have to uh, dilate a balloon. Your, your catheter goes in, you decide what is the area. Here is a tumor distal to that area. You've already uh, identified which segment the tumor is in. And then you dilate the balloon. So the balloon blocks off this area. And then you, uh, you spray it with vapor. It's a guided vapor. It's not just your normal steam. It is vapor at high, high pressure and high temperature. And the vapor burns away the tumor. This therapy is also being used for uh, asthma. But predominantly nowadays, they're talking about using this as a, as a technology for causing burns and heat ablation of uh, peripheral tumors. Uh, let's talk a little bit about endobronchial BVRS. Now, this is the most important thing, okay? Is this clear? So far, so good. Now, two more things left, which are quite important, actually. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. Uh, BVRS, which is endoscopic uh, lung volume reduction surgery, and EMN, which is end, uh, electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. So emphysema can be treated by BVRS. Uh, the evidence is coming in now. More and more papers are coming in. There is no meta-analysis as yet, but there are a couple of trials going on, and I'll tell you about them. Uh, how do you endobronchially uh, treat emphysema? You can either put in an endobronchial blocker and block away that distal area, which is uh, emphysematous, or you can put in a one-way valve, and so the air cannot go in, but whatever air is trapped in the diseased tissue will come out. So the area will slowly over a period of time collapse. Or you can use coils. Coils create a fibrous reaction and cause collapse of the affected bronchi. And thereby the distal uh, emphysema will start to collapse and you'll get a collapse of the airway. Or you can open up a bronchoscopic, uh, uh, you can open up an emphysematous channel Across the, across the endobronchial tissue into the next segment. So whatever is emphysematous and bullous will actually collapse into the normal airway and come out. Okay, so it's called as an airway bypass stent. So let's look at each one of them. You also have options of using bronco, bronchoscopic thermal vapor ablation. Uh, this is uh, for destroying the endobronchial tissue, which I showed you earlier for asthma and for tumor, you can use the same technology for causing collapse consolidation of emphysematous lung. Nowadays, we've gone biological. You can use actually biological uh, material within the bronchus. It's called as bio-LVR. Uh, this is new. This has not uh, been published much about. Uh, so you actually block the, the distal airway with a biological material to cause collapse consolidation of the distal uh, segment. So the, um, and then there is one more technique called as polymer LVR, called as poly LVR. So these are two new technologies which are being used for, uh, for uh, BVRS. And the last, which is again a very new technology, it's called as targeted nerve denervation. So you get into the bronchus and you use an RF ablation energy to actually cut the nerves that are supplying that area. The moment you cut the nerves, the, the airway will collapse and that there will be distal uh, uh, consolidation, collapse consolidation, atelectasis. And that will actually give you the desired effect for the patient. So this uh, slide you must take on board. These are newer techniques that are used for, uh, for uh, bronchoscopic uh, lung volume reduction surgery. These are not published in textbooks, okay? These are all papers. And I've got you stuff from individual papers. So let's look at this. So the standard one we used to use over many years was Watanabe spigot. Uh, this is a spigot which is available 
you go endobronchially, identify whichever is the segment and just push in the spigot there and hope that the distal area causes atelectasis and collapse and consolidation. But not very good because frequently the patient used to cough out the spigot. spigot. Uh, you know, it does have some struts on the side to hold it into the area, but it's very difficult to get exact sizing of it. And uh, it was an old technique. And the problem was not coughing it out. As I told you, the problem was if it went to the normal side, it will cause atelectasis on the normal side. And these people, emphysematous people, are already compromised. The last thing you want is problem on the other side. So it's an issue. So they really didn't work. Then we have got endobronchial valves. So endobronchial valves, you use it in two ways. One is either you deploy the valve or you use what is called as a chartic mapping for collateral circulation. So when you are going to put in a valve into a bronchus, you want to make sure that there is no collateral circulation because what you're trying to do is stop all air going into that segment. If you have collateral circulation, which means there are openings from the other side, no matter what you do into the, into the bronchus, that area which is distal to the valve will not collapse. And that is why you have a system called a chartist, which actually helps you to map exactly the presence or the absence of collateral circulation. So you can decide whether you, it is worth putting in an endobronchial valve in this patient or not, whether he will get clinical benefit or not. So endobronchial valves are available and valves can also be used for closure of air leaks. So now let's go into details of this, okay? Uh, so this is the first meta-analysis which has come through, uh, 2015, where efficacy of endobronchial valves for advanced emphysema. And these are now starting to show benefits. So they have done a meta-analysis, looked at all the studies that are available. In fact, there are more studies now coming in 2019 and 2020, all of them suggesting that endobronchial valves are good for advanced emphysema, okay? So what are the standard valves available? There were two types of valves available. There was Zephyr and there was IBV. Uh, the Zephyr valve is a, is a strut with a, with a one-way system inside. And the in, good thing about IBV, which is the spiration valve, it has hooks on the side. So these hooks actually hook onto the uh, bronchial mucosa and prevent migration. The problem with this is migration. Because if they cough uh, very forcefully, this valve will get thrown out. As opposed to that, this valve hooks has hooks which go into the bronchial mucosa and it has got an anchor pad as well. So this is like a fish hook. So you cannot easily uh, cough it out. And the other good thing about the spiration valve is it has, got a, it has got a rod, which you can actually, if you want to take out the valve in future, not leave a foreign body behind, you can actually go in and grasp this with a biopsy forceps and pull the whole valve out. This will of course cause a little bit of mucosal damage, but that is not such a big problem. It's really, uh, it, it's when you're doing it for air, air leak. And I'll talk about it in a minute. So this is the two valves side by side to show you what the two look like. Uh, the principle of this uh, IBV valve is that air will come but cannot go through because this is closed and all the secretions will come out from the side and any trapped air will come out from the side. So no air goes in and then this distal area gets collapsed and gradually becomes uh, atelectatic, okay? And I'll show you a video of this in a minute. So this is how you deploy the valve under bronchoscopic guidance. All of these are deployed under bronchoscopic guidance. But before you do this, you have to do what is called as chartist collateral ventilation assessment. So what you do in a chartist is you put in a bronchoscope, you put in a catheter, and you inflate the catheter. Once the balloon catheter is, is inflated, it occludes the direct flow of inspired air. And then at the tip of this uh, catheter, you're measuring how much amount of air is going in, you're measuring how much amount of air is coming out, and more importantly, you're measuring how much is the airway pressure. The moment you close this, the airway pressure must go in, and the inspiration uh, and expiration, uh, the ex inspiration and expiration should go down. So I'll show you this picture. Just see this video first, and I'll show you the graph. This is how you do it. You go into the bronchoscope. Uh, with a bronchoscope, you go into the affected area. You decide where you want to do uh, uh, BVRS. And then you can measure this. You can actually inflate the balloon and close off this. So now you're temporarily creating a situation that would have been created by the valve. 
and once you have done this then the charting happens here you've got all these chartings that are looking at and the charting is like this the expiratory airflow is orange so the top part is orange the inspiratory pressure is blue okay and the airway pressure is green so whenever you inflate the balloon no air will come out so expiration should stop okay but inspiration continues going there so no air is coming out and most importantly the airway pressure is going up so orange goes away the green increases in size but the resistance goes up as well as opposed to that so this is no collateral ventilation if this happens this is what is no collateral ventilation but if you inflate the balloon and the orange is still continuing and the green is same but no increase of airway resistance that means air is coming into the distal area from somewhere else that is the way you identify it so it tells you exactly what is happening distal to your valve or distal to your balloon so eventually you'll be able to make a clinic so this is a good patient to put in a put in a endobronchial valve this is not a good patient to put in an endobronchial valve so this will fail this will not fail so let's look at the endobronchial valve and see how they put it in a uh, couple of videos See the hooks are hooking onto the mucosa and the valve is opening. And all the trapped air is coming from the side of the valve. And then gradually with fibrosis, all of this is starting to collapse. Okay. And that is how you get atelectasis. If you need to remove, you put in a biopsy forceps grasp it and just pull and that will just come out with the thing okay this is actually actual procedure that we are doing we are going in there this is deploying a valve catheter going in we are gauging the area that we need to deploy we are measuring the size of the uh, small airway. Gives you an idea that your valve is sitting snugly. It has to come within the two blues of that thing. Otherwise, it will be too loose and it will cough it up. And now the valve is being deployed. And there you are. And you never do just one valve. You have to do multiple valves. To obstruct because you have to go into each of the sub segments and try and block off uh, as many segments as possible because you're really trying to get about 30 percent reduction in the volume of the of the emphysematous thing so you have to measure like this see it's important to measure if, if it falls within the struts of the two blue then uh, this valve will sit snugly if it does not if it's a larger airway the valve will just be coughed out and that's no good for the patient so you deploy more than one valve, usually three to four valves at a time. So it's, it's, it's an expensive procedure. Each valve is about 1500 euros. So at any single time, you know, you're deploying at least 10, 15,000 euros worth of uh, equipment in there because uh, it includes bronchoscopy and things like that. Uh, this is another valve deployment taking place uh, just to show you how it happens. Technically, it's a very easy procedure. It's not difficult at all. Uh, anybody with uh, half a sense of uh, bronchial anatomy and uh, anybody who knows how to do rigid flexible bronchoscopy can do it. This is done only with flexible bronchoscopy. You don't even need a rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, look at that. See the valve, the trapped air is coming out through the valve. So that's important. Uh, this is after the BBRS. You know, we are doing a repeat bronchoscopy and we want to have a look and see how well the area has collapsed. So as you go in, you can see this is collapsed. Can you see that? 
so this is a collapsed lower lobe and there we are uh, not lower lobe upper lobe and there we are and these are all the valves sitting in there one two and three valves uh, in this situation you just leave it in you don't take it out but uh, when we are doing uh, for uh, air leak we take it out look at that so over a period of time it will just get collapsed and fibrosed and then the whole thing will be a bvrs okay so this is how it is a huge emphysematous area and all of it is collapsed and consolidated and so the normal lung which was compressed here starts to expand and that is what gives you benefit of the endobronchial valves uh, we also use endobronchial valves for uh, stopping post-operative air leaks uh, or uh, so how you do that is you go into the airway uh, uh you you have a patient with a chest strain which has got a bubbling chest strain. you 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 take him to the theater you go into the theater you put in your uh, flexible bronchoscope get into the uh, operated side or, or or this is not in an operated patient this is in a patient who's got prolonged air leak so you go into the operated uh, into the side that has got the chest strain and you collapse each of the segment with a balloon the moment you inflate the balloon in the affected segment, you will immediately see a drop in the uh, air leak. So the air leak will stop once the balloon is inflated. And that will give you an idea of where exactly to put in the valve. Uh, can be used even in a post-operative patient as well to segmentally block an area which is leaking air. Uh, not the one that you've operated, but the rest of the lung. You don't know where the air leak is taking, uh, taking place from. You can get into the uh, normal lung and try to find out, and you can actually put in a balloon, a, a valve, and that causes collapse atelectasis of that segment, and the collapse atelectasis allows that uh, tear to heal. And then after six weeks, once the chest drain has been removed and patient is fine, you go back in and pull that uh, valve out, and the lung can get back to normal. So it, it, is a, it is a temporary technique to allow the lung to collapse and to heal over the, over the, over the area. So this has also been published uh, in uh, JTD. Uh, it's not actually, uh, you know, th these are things that are still very much within the uh, early use uh, domain. So here you are, this is a thing, you inflate the balloon, and you completely occlude this bronchus and see what's happening in the drain. The moment you know that the air leak stopped, that's the place where you uh, deploy the valve. So these are the valves deployed and you can very easily catch this and take it out uh, four to six weeks later. Okay, so what are the problems with endobronchial valves? Uh, migration is a big problem. Uh, they can actually migrate. You can cough them out. Uh, blockage of the normal side is a bigger problem. The valve goes to the other side and remember it goes the reverse way. So if it goes reverse way, it actually blocks. Rather than allowing the trapped air to come out, it completely does not allow anything to go through. So that causes atelectasis on the normal side. And so the atelectasis can cause infection or the valve itself can cause infection uh, on the side that you're affected. Endobronchial coils are a new technology that are being used. There is more and more data coming through for use of endobronchial valves, but you have to use more of them uh, to get the desired effect and they can also be used bilaterally still used only within trials it's not freely available in the in the uk still uh, used within the trial the important thing to uh, remember is uh, reset trial okay so they are looking at the use of endobronchial coils within the reset trial and this is the one that we want to know exactly how things are happening okay and and it has just come up with results saying that uh, uh, endobronchial coils may actually improve the quality of life for the patient. What you do in an airway bypass for BVRS is you identify the segment of the wall uh, of the airway and then you use a Doppler to make sure there is no blood flow in that wall or in that segment where you're going to make a hole. And then you fenestrate it with a needle and then pass a balloon dilator, dilator over it, increase the space of that communication into the next segment and then you deploy a paclitaxel eluting stent something like this this is what it looks like and so what you're doing is what was an affected area you're effectively giving it allowing it for the trapped air to go into the next segment and then be breathed out because the in this segment the 
the elasticity is not so good but in the next segment the elasticity may be still maintained and the patient will be able to breathe out and thereby the lung will collapse because the trapped air or the residual volume will actually go down and that might help the patient again uh, there are a lot of issues with using this airway bypass uh, the stents usually get occluded by granulation tissue stents get lost in the parenchyma of the lung there can be exacerbation of copd pneumothorax infections and really the benefits were not very clear so airway bypass stent almost is given up in the in europe nobody actually uses it anymore but for theory you need to know about these things uh, thermal ablation we spoke about uh, distally you you burn the thing with hot air to cause a collapse consolidation uh, biological agents that are used for uh, lung, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction are biodegradable products they actually die away with time so with stents they stay there for life and they may cause infection biodegradable degradable products actually burn away so you can actually use blood patches there are various blood patches available you can use a fibrin plug in the distal area uh, or you can use a new device called as hydrogel this is a hydrogel plug which goes and blocks the bronchus but uh, over a period of time it dissolves away so it doesn't stay there and there is a new system called as air seal system which uses a polymer and this is a dissolvable polymer and it's called as poly lvr uh, so this is a new system that is available for uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery and then this is the latest paper which has come out for targeted denervation so what they are doing is they are getting into the bronchus and they are using rf ablation to cut off the nerves these are the neural things that are getting cut off and because the nerves are getting cut off there is bronchospasm of that diseased area and there is lung volume reduction collapse and consolidation of that emphysematous segment and uh, this gives rise to uh, bvrs so this is something that is being spoken of and being done nowadays uh, still experimental but uh, will be in uh, normal uh, domain soon okay are we okay guys you still okay can i continue to uh, emr yes, yes sir yes sir okay so this is the last uh, phase but this is quite important this is the new baby on the block really not really new it's been around for a little while and i'll talk to you through that so whenever you have a lung nodule there are many pathology particularly in the periphery is very sometimes very difficult to get a biopsy if it is here it's okay but if it is here what do you do you know you can't get a trans uh, uh, ct guided biopsy because it's right in the medial side uh, so you have to do what is called as weightful watching or if it is uh, you, you know central uh, tra traditional bronchoscopy can only get to here that's the problem uh, radial ebus can stop here it doesn't go beyond this is not possible by radial ebus so somewhere here up to the tertiary it's okay but into the quaternary bronchus the radial ebus is no good cannot reach out there uh, trans thoracic uh, needle aspiration cannot reach here in the quaternary or in the medial surfaces is very difficult and depends on the technique that's available surgery is an option but really to do a surgery for a solitary pulmonary nodule is a disaster uh, without uh, histological confirmation so that's why they developed the emm system which is the electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy so not for the close ups but for the really distal tumors in inaccessible areas um and uh, you know into the quaternary and even beyond the fifth and sixth segment sub segment of the bronchial tree the emm can actually get into that area so you start with a spiral ct with a thin 1 mm cut Uh, the spiral ct is then uploaded into a navigation system and the navigation system then recreates what is called as a virtual bronchoscopy and the virtual bronchoscopy uh, does anatomic registration on the emm machine uh, and a 3d ct image is recreated and it gives you a pathway to go into the distal uh, airway so what it does really is it's called as uh, let me see. come here it, it it what it does is it actually creates a satellite based direction mapping okay so it is actually based on sat nav so what happens is um, whatever if this is a tumor here the tumor and your bronchoscope the tip of the bronchoscope is has a magnetic uh, probe which actually sends back signals 
to your main uh, satellite. So this is the satellite and the tip of the bronchoscope is your car. And by electromagnetic navigation, the system creates a pathway to go into the distal bronchus. It actually creates a pathway to tell you where exactly to go. It actually tells you what's the next road, what's the next road. So it's exactly like a GPS uh, system. And I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, let's see the video. This is how it looks like. These are the machines that you've got. This is the edge technology that you've got. Uh, this is the probe. There is a uh, super sensitive uh, magnetic device at the tip, which is working like a GPS for uh, guiding you into that pathway. So let's look at the video. Sorry, just one second. So this is how you mark, how you plan the procedure. So the CT of the patient is uploaded into the system. The system identifies the CT, you do a 3D reconstruction, and then it recreates a virtual bronchoscopy for you to go in. So look, look at here, we are targeting that, we are telling the system that the tumor is here. So the system doesn't decide where the tumor is. You have to tell the system where is the tumor, and then it will create a virtual bronchoscopy. Watch that happening. This is a real patient. So it has now calculated what is the shortest pathway. Okay, through the virtual bronchoscopy, it has said this is the shortest pathway. Exactly like GPS, it actually calculates which is the shortest pathway with the least amount of bend. What you don't want is bends because bends will then actually make it uh, difficult for you to manipulate your catheter. So it tries to go the straightest path into that catheter. And here is your sensor. It tells you that this is where you have to go. And then when you reach there, it tells you go right or go left. Um, and you, you keep watching this on the screen through the virtual bronchoscopy. So you can actually do this procedure a day before in a virtual way and then go in and do the procedure on the patient. So this mapping is very important. The mapping is what leads you into that. And then uh, you learn how to do this, okay? So it's quite important to understand this. Uh, one small video, just to show you. And the path, it's called a super dimension edge. Uh, this is uh, produced by the, by Medtronic. Uh, and Medtronic are the ones who are actually pushing it quite heavily. At Bart's, the system that we have is a Medtronic, Covidian system. 
and and they are the ones who are actually say uh, supporting uh, this technology. Again, similar. I've spoken about this earlier. Okay. So it it is a technology which is used for enhanced visualization, for accurate modeling. So a three D construction can be created out of a two D imaging technology that you've done. It compensates the CT to the body divergence. So whenever you have a 2D uh, thing uh, and, and your body is different, it actually compensates for the difference between the two and gives you correct navigation. And it allows the catheter position in relative to the nodule. The most important thing is the catheter has to go right into the center of the nodule. And that's what it allows. And even goes for really small nodules uh, uh, up to up to very very small sizes like two or three millimeter nodules you can get into there. Smaller the size of the nodule, less is the accuracy of the of the thing. So you really um, have to be careful about that. Uh, you can do a callback or you can record your uh, pathway. Uh, so also for medical legal, this is very important. You can save it and you can use it for medical legal uh, uh, advice. So EMN is used for diagnostics as we just saw or it can be used for therapeutic as well. So the diagnostics are for peripheral lesions, uh, lesions covered by scapula or by ribs, where you cannot do a CT guided biopsy, uh, mediastinal lesions, which means uh, on the mediastinal side of the pleura, where your CT guided biopsy needle cannot, be, cannot go, and for very small GGOs, okay? So really tiny GGOs can be accurately localized using the EMN bronchoscopy. Uh, you can do multiple biopsies of the same lesion. So, you know, your guide catheter stays in place. The tools can go in and out. You can use a brush, you can use a needle, you can use a biopsy faucet. So the guide catheter is locked into place and multiple tools can go in and out of the same lesion. More importantly, multiple lesions can be biopsied at the same time. So it's a pretty good tool for giving you a biopsies of multiple GGOs or multiple nodules. And it works very well for mediastinal lesions. We're talking about mediastinal lesions on the mediastinal surface of the lung. We're not talking about uh, uh, mediastinal lesions. There's less risk of pneumothorax. That's the other thing that you have to remember that, you know, because you are, is guided, you're not going through the pleura. You're staying within the pleura all the time. Uh, and and uh, this is, this is uh, really, really a good tool for the tiny peripheral uh, lesions. So what are the therapeutic ENMs? So once you have, Diagnose this tumor, you've taken a biopsy, uh, the biopsy has come back positive. How does ENM help you with surgery? Because these are tiny nodules that you're picking up, and uh, you know, to really feel them and uh, do it by VATS is, is a very difficult position. So, what you can do is once the catheter is locked into position, you can actually inject that little nodule with a dye. And when you go in by VATS from the side, you can actually see the color very clearly and tell you, tells you, pick this up, pick this tissue up and wedge it out. So it's a way of biopsying. You can leave a metallic marker there. So you can actually, under fluoroscopic guidance, understand where is the metallic marker, pick up the lung tissue and wedge it out. Or you can put in a coil there. Coil again is radiolucent and radio opaque and it will tell you exactly where to go. It can also facilitate SBRT. So, you know, if you put in a, 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 a call there on the uh, SBRT, if somebody wants to op, uh, give SBRT to that small tumor, then the marker will help you to plan your CT and plan your radiation dose. Some people are talking about using a glue. So what you do is you go into that small lesion and inject the glue. The, the glue will be felt as a hard nodule. The problem with the GGO is when you go by VATS and you palpate with your finger, you cannot feel the uh, GGO because it's not a nodule as yet. Whereas the moment you put glue into it, these glues uh, do not destroy the histology of the GGO. So they can be actually, uh, once you take them to the histology lab, you can, you can dissolve the glue away and have the normal histology retained. So the stuff that they use is not just normal glue. These are all special uh, chemical agents which form a nodule, but they dissolve away on histology. And now the latest one is the RFID chip. And I'll talk about this in a minute. So you can actually fire an RFID chip into the GGO and then come in by VATS from the side and the RFID chip exactly like in a, in a, in a supermarket shop, you, you have these barcodes. So the RFID chip has a barcode. So when you put a scanner by VATS 
on the surface of the lung, the RFID chip will start to beep and you will know exactly where is that RFID chip and you pick it up and you wedge it out and send it for the histology. And in histology, they'll cut open, throw away the RFID chip and process the tissue. So you can put multiple RFID chips and uh, biopsy, multiple uh, GGOs. And, and all of this is done in the hybrid OR. You really need hybrid OR. And the technique is called as IVATS, okay? Image guided VATS, which means that you use EMN to highlight the nodule and then go by VATS and you, do, you biopsy all these nodules. And most of this is now being done by single port uh, IVATS, okay? And this is being published now. Um, uh, Calvin Nug is one of the guys who's doing a lot of it from, uh, from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, Calvin from uh, Bart's My Hospital is also publishing quite, uh, quite a lot on this uh, technology. And these are the two guys who are leading the world of uh, EMN. So this is what you mean by a, a blue dye. So you go in via EMN, you inject a dye, and when you go in by VATS, you know exactly where to wedge out. You do not have to even feel this area. You just wedge it out and take it out, and you know you've got the correct uh, small biopsy. Uh, uh, you can also use your uh, things to put in a uh, guide wire, and the guide wire will tell you where exactly to biopsy. That's another technology that's available. Uh, you can put in fiducial markers. Uh, you can see this. And the fiducial markers will tell you where to plan your radiotherapy. It's, it's a good tool for radiotherapy for fiducial markers. So look here, you've gone in with the EMN, your catheter is in there, you have actually fired the fiducial markers. And when you go in into the radiotherapy suite, you can actually plan your radiotherapy. This is the area that I want to take out and that is what's going to get rid of the GGO. So it's, it's quite a good one. And then the new one which got released uh, last year, late last year, was the RFID chip. Uh, Hiroshi Date uh, and uh, my good friend Sato. Sato is the guy who's actually done most of the work on this. Uh, they have uh, developed this chip. So you go in by bronchoscope, fire the chip, and then you go in by a thoracoscope, and this is a probe, and the probe goes in and you start, uh, uh, you know, you, you, it beeps when you see the RFID chip, and it gives you an idea exactly where is the GGO. And, and you can take it out in the hybrid OR and then do whatever you want to do with the specimen. So it is quite good for excision of the specimen. You can also do therapeutic ablations by EMN guidance now. And, and this is the new baby on the block. You can use RF ablation under EMN guidance and you can put, put in an RF ablation probe and kill the GGO, kill the cancer. And now uh, you have now come up with microwave ablation. So Bart's is one of the first uh, uh, hospitals in the country. Uh, Kelvin has done this work uh, and he has uh, done uh, a number of cases with microwave ablation of, of a GGO. Uh, so uh, endobronchial treatment of lung cancer. Uh, you have an option for this technology to develop to, into uh, localized radiotherapy or localized intratumoral chemotherapy. This technology will help you uh, do all of this. And these are the papers which are coming out, uh, you know, pretty recent papers which are now talking about all these technologies. Uh, so this is the RF ablation catheters that are used. Uh, there's a multicentric trial going on for microwave ablation at the moment, and they will publish soon. Uh, this is how it works. The probe goes into the tumor and the microwave ablates the tumor into that area. Uh, you can also use the same technology for endobronchial radiation or intratumoral chemotherapy. So there are many, 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 many advances that are happening in uh, endobronchial surgery. And, uh, you know, you really need to keep up to date with everything. You've got to keep uh, attending meetings to know what are the newer technologies. Atul Mehta is one of the big guys. Uh, he's a pulmonologist in uh, the U.S. and he he uh, talks a lot about endobronchial surgeries and, and electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopies. So what about uh, natural orifice? We've spoken about uh, endobronchial EMN. Couple of slides on natural orifice. The, the, the endoscopes have all gone into steerable endoscopes. So you can hold the endoscope and you can have devices coming at the pit. Okay, and you can actually catch a tumor and you can resect a tumor using a diathermy. Uh, you can do what is called as endoluminal surgery. So we are now getting into a domain of endobronchial lobectomy. 
So what you do is you come in via the bronchus, you come in there, uh, your micro, you make an incision into the bronchus, your endoscope comes out, you look for your tumor, you clip, clip, clamp, clamp, uh, your, your whatever area is there, the tumor, you take it out, and then uh, the tumor comes out, and then on the way out, you suture it. Uh, the way to take the tumor out is by either by forceps grasping, bring it out, or by using liquid biopsy. So you put the tumor into a little pouch and you uh, ablate it and the tumor becomes cells and you absorb the cell or you wash the cell back. And, and, and on your way out, as you're coming out, you put a couple of sutures into that area. So this is localized uh, surgery for lung resection. You're not doing a whole lobectomy, but you're doing essentially a sub-sub-segmentectomy uh, or sub-sub-segmental bronchus resection for small tumors. Uh, and of course, the last but not the least is the endoluminal robots. The endoluminal robots are really coming in in a big way. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in endoluminal robots and you will soon be able to operate uh, without really being next to the patient and the bronchoscopic robot will go in there and uh, the instruments will come out and you will operate exactly as I showed you previously. So that is being called as, uh, as, as a natural orifice. So the reality is that uh, things are changing fast. Things are changing really fast. The only thing constant in life is change, most important. You've really got to be receptive to change. If you're still doing what you did 15 years ago, something is wrong. You've got to realize that things are changing fast. And the only people who survive are the people who are most responsive to change. If you change early and you adapt new technologies, chances are you will last a longer time because you guys are young guys. You need to know this stuff and you need to know what is uh, possible in the future is going to happen now. So get involved with the technology from the word go and you will make a huge difference. But remember, the technology is good. It looks all flashy. Great. You know, very, very, sounds very, you know, here's a guy giving you a teleconference about... Uh, robotic endobronchial surgery is looking all sexy, nicely dressed up in a suit and all that. But the basics is the most important. Don't get carried away by the flashy bits. Understand that look beyond the technology. Don't forget, look beyond the technology. The, you know, this is the basics of thoracic surgery. So don't forget open surgery. Open surgery still got a role in your management, but this is the future, okay? This still stays the same. Thank you very much. <sighs> okay, guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, sir. It was a very long lecture, but it was really important. I covered <laughs> everything that I could. Questions? Five um, questions. Sir, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Sir, uh, how much like this? You said something about endo finger. Endo finger. I, what? It's like this, but in uh, previous. Uh, I don't know what is endo finger. I, I heard it in your lectures itself. Really? I didn't understand it. Because Because it is coming come in our exams. Endo finger. I couldn't find in one of your lectures in that uh, midterm CM is the CM is your set uh, modifications. Uh, that's why you may have misread it. I don't know. I don't remember using the word end of it. For this tumor localization, sorry to me, not you. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. I, I don't know what where I said end of finger. It doesn't ring a bell in my, in my mind, to be honest. Okay, next question. I'll look it up, Arif. I'll tell you. I mean, this is a topic where I have researched extensively. I know exactly what are the new advances, everything that's happening. Uh, end of finger is not ringing a bell. So, let, let me look. I'm pretty sure I heard it in your lecture, sir. It's midterm process CME. It happened in Assam, Guwahati. I, and I had taken all their slides, uh, pictures also. But I... I think I missed that one slide. I just can't remember. Sure it was Not possible because I have been through 10 presentations to make this one. Okay. These are 10 presentations I've done over the over the last uh, couple of years, which I put it together. 
for you guys to understand everything in one go. Okay, just leave it with me. I'll see. I'll find out. I, it doesn't ring a bell. And if it doesn't ring a bell, means if I don't know what I'm talking about, then uh, probably it's a misread from your side. I'll, I'll look it up. Next. <laughs> Two and a half hours I've spoke to you. You only have to come up with end of finger. Arif, kya are you? Can I ask a question? Fitun, come in. Tell me. Thank you. Uh, is there a role for endobronchial stand for in pediatric cardiac surgery when, let's say, there is pulmonary hypertension pressing on the bronchus and the child failed to extubate? Is there a role for that? We have used, uh, not in pediatrics, but I have used endobronchial stenting in patients who have not been able to extubate as a temporizing method. Uh, I personally don't know about pediatric cardiac, whether it's been used or not. Uh, but if a patient is not being extubated because of uh, uh, polychondritis or uh, tracheomalacia and things like that, we do use endobronchial stenting for uh, getting the patient off the ventilator and then uh, over a period of time uh, trying to rid the patient of the stent. The problem is uh, uh, using a stent in a, in, in a benign disease uh, yes. over a long period of time has a lot of complications because stents are foreign bodies in the airway and they cause irritation and they cause a lot of uh, cough reflex. Patients don't tolerate them well. So using stents in malignant conditions are quite okay. But using stents in benign condition, you really need to be careful about uh, the use. We use them for temporary situations, but they get but embedded. Not for pulmonary uh, hypertension, right? I, I have personally never used it. Like I have that. never used it, to be honest. Okay. I have never used it in that situation. So honestly, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, okay. I, I'll have to look it up. But I have personally never used it. I have not come out, come out into an indication where Stents will help a pulmonary hypertension. I've never seen that. I see. Okay, thank you. But, but I don't do pediatric cardiac, so I, I will have to ask my colleagues. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank Anything you. else? Is there a... Sir, Vikas, yes, sir. Yeah, Vikas. Tell me. In traumatic tracheal esophageal fistula, are we justified in putting a tracheal stent? And if yes, just is the length, sir, how long yeah. we can... No, no, no. That depends on, it depends on the size of the tear. Uh, it depends on the size of the tracheoesophageal fistula. We do use, uh, predominantly the first port of call is the esophagus. So you Esoph try not to, you, you don't do the tracheal side, you do the esophageal side. But if you're still getting leak around the esophageal stand, then you can go in and put in a stand into the trachea. But remember, in a chronic tracheoesophageal fistula, um, two stands and tissue between two stands gives rise to ischemia. That is the risk. You understand? If there's a solid thing on this side and a solid thing on this side, tissue between it actually doesn't heal that well. Uh, but, but temporarily you can use it, yes. But esophagus sure. is the one I prefer. Whenever so, I, have a, I have a tear or I have a tracheal fistula, I will predominantly put into the esophagus. It will be a covered stent, right? Covered stent, yeah, yeah, covered stent. And is it a permanent solution or a time buying measure? Time buying measure. So you have to go in <laughs> surgically later. No, 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 no. These things don't work with surgically. You hope it heals. <laughs> no, no, you, if you have put esophagus, will you go later surgically to correct it? Put some medical wrapping or something? No. Yeah, in the long term, you is can do that. In, in a long term, that is, uh, we'll talk about. Tracheoesophageal fistula management uh, at a later stage. I'll do that. I've got that talk ready actually. But uh, okay. in a long term, you operate on them, but not in an acute term. Because acute term, they are always not good tissue to suture. They always give way. You can go in and operate, but they always give way and you get recurrence. So you, you use the stent to buy time to, to get the patient uh, as fit as possible. And then in the long term, you go ahead and operate. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, who's next? There are two people who are raising at one minute. Let me see who that. Who's that? Who just said, sir? Uh, yeah, sir, Sundaram Pillai, sir. Yeah, Sundaram, tell me. Uh, sir, during any endobronchial procedure, what are the precautions we need to take so that the uh, debris doesn't fall onto the distal passage, distal airway? Uh, we, uh, the important thing is, whatever you do, 
endobronchially, you always have to do a distal bronchoscopy and suction out. Debris falling is okay, but you have to suction it out. And you have to really, uh, you know, make. So one thing that you do is when you grasp it with the forceps, do not pull the forceps back into the bronchoscope because that will cause the debris to fall off. So whenever you've grasped it with the forceps, you take the whole apparatus out as a whole with the, with the, with the grasper out, not in the channel because the channel is small. But a little bit of debris will always fall. We always do a very good suction wash of the distal areas before we come out, always. So some debris will go distally, but uh, it, 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 it doesn't I think, really matter. I think, I think but what we wanted to ask is distal protection like vascular disease. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Your your voice broke. Is there something? Is it, there something like a distal protection device like vascular people use in no, no, or something? No, 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 no. In the airway, it doesn't matter. You've got so much uh, airway on both sides. There is yeah. you don't. The problem is you cannot go distally because there is obstruction in your way. Already, yes, sir. The, you know, to put any distal protection device, you should be able to go beyond the obstruction. Most of the times, you cannot go beyond the obstruction. It's a very narrow passage, and you can hardly put in a little guide wire through it. Leave alone a, right. uh, a catheter to put in a device. So most of the times, we operate, go in, you start buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. You you do uh, manual debridement as much as possible, and buzz, 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 and suck, uh, and then you just deploy a stand. And then once you are deployed the stand, either you you, you go through the stent and go distally and suck everything out. Uh, there is no way you can go distally because it's an end the system. And, uh, yes. Sir. There is no pathway to go distally. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, next question. Who else is that? Jib Jibril Khalil. Yes, sir. Hi, Jibril. Where are you Thank from, you, Jibril? I, I... I am actually from Nigeria, but I'm doing oh, my, my fellowship in Narayana, Rabindrana Togo. At, uh, Tell us. At, at, uh, so Tell my us question, people. yeah, my first question is uh, about uh, removing foreign body. We had cases where patient developed uh, hypoxia during the procedure and uh, bradycardia following following stimulation of the airway. Is there any 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 guidelines concerning that? For example, uh, when you use a rigid bronchoscope on a patient. Who is undergoing uh, foreign body removal? Like the where you need to stop, and if there is anything to give to reduce a uh, bradycardia, which can develop from stimulation of the airway. And then, secondly, uh, the patients with uh, massive uh, hemoptysis, we know we used to use uh, rigid bronchoscopes. Is there any any new? Uh, out of these new procedures, any of them be used as a replacement for uh, controlling this massive hemoptysis in this kind of patient, okay. more especially those with TB. Thank you. Yeah, good, good questions. Very good question. Now, I, I deliberately didn't deal much with foreign bodies because uh, I wanted to cover more of the newer technologies rather than uh, speak about techniques of removing a foreign body. Uh, the bottom line is uh, whenever I do a foreign body, I will always consent the patient for surgery. Okay, mm -hmm. always. As a rule, that's my, that's my standby. In case things go wrong and I'm not able to do whatever I want to do, then my standby is plus minus open surgery. Okay, that's one rule of the game. The second thing is that in anesthesia, you really need a very good anesthetist. It is absolutely mandatory. I personally don't do foreign bodies under, uh, under local anesthesia and flexible bronchoscopy. But because I'm a surgeon, I don't do it. Uh, I, my pulmonologist does it sometimes, but uh, uh, he's had a couple of issues, a uh, couple of patients where he had issues. And so he now does it in my theater under general anesthesia. The other thing is I always try to put in, as, as you know, over the years uh, that I've done uh, flexible or rigid bronchoscopy, I always start with the rigid bronchoscope because the rigid bronchoscope gives you airway. The most important thing is airway. The reason why these people get compromised is because airway is compromised. Okay. If you are able to have ventilation, then 
everything comes under control all the bradycardia and everything else that you get is because airway is compromised because you are not able to ventilate and so the one tool that you must use in your theater is a sandless jet insufflator okay jibril i have a feeling that you may not have that in your setup no, uh, a sandless don't. jet insufflator is mandatory you should really not do all these uh, complex endobronchial uh, procedures even including removing a foreign body without the presence of a sandless jet insufflator the reason why a patient is compromised and why you had to pull out is because he was not being adequately ventilated when you sedated him or you put him under ga the moment you use a sandless jet insufflator no matter what the situation the high frequency jet pushes the oxygen sure. past any uh, any obstruction so it yeah. is very very important to have a jet insufflation on table when you are doing that of course there are times when the patient is not hemodynamically okay you have to pull out and come out and then wait for the patient and go in on another setting on another day you can do that you don't want a dead patient the bottom line is you want a live patient in and a live patient out so for me personally yeah. i am very happy to defer the surgery for another day to stabilize him a bit more i'll get the cardiologist involved if they want to use any medical therapy to stabilize the heart i am happy but 90% of the times the problem is ventilation not cardiac this is not a cardiac problem it is a ventilatory problem and so that's why i mm. would suggest you must use a good anesthetist who knows how to deal with these situation and you you must use jet ventilator that is the key even when you are taking out foreign bodies now there have been situations where i have had to open and take out some foreign bodies few in my experience very few most of them come out by endobronchial techniques uh, but i don't do it at the same sitting what i'll do is do i've consented it i will actually come out let the patient stabilize and then reschedule on another day in a more elective way because at that moment if the patient has compromised and you start doing major surgeries it is it's it, it's going to give you adverse outcomes okay so that's the first uh, answer the second answer to the question in massive hemorrhages uh, the the real trick is uh, to isolate to protect the normal lung you understand that is the key whenever you are dealing with massive bleeding your whole idea of getting in there you cannot stop the bleeding what you want to do is protect the normal lung yeah so that the patient can be alive why does this patient die when you get massive hemoptysis uh, hemoptysis patients don't yeah. die because of volume loss yeah. they die because they drown in the blood yeah. okay so the best thing and the first thing you need to do is a double lumen tube to the opposite side that's the first first principle of massive hemoptysis is protect the normal side so you can put in a double lumen tube on the opposite side and then if you want you can put in a bronchial blocker onto the affected side and then you can do whatever techniques you can do laser ablation if you see the massive in a massive hemoptysis you cannot see the bleeding it's a very very aggressive yeah. situation where you protect the normal side if you protect the normal side and you get the guy through the night next day you can operate and get rid of that uh, affected side or you can do endobronchial procedures like adrenaline wash etc or bronchial blockers you have got endobronchial glues for uh, blocking off that bronchus yeah. and things like that or you've got surgical option you can go in by surgery and you can take out that lung or that lobe if you've got an obvious pathology but the philosophy of management is always protect the normal side most important so a double lumen tube is mandatory in these patients okay thank you very good question thank you yeah who else any more questions uh yes sir yeah who's raising hello aparesh is it aparesh yes yeah yes sir yes sir so uh, one question sir uh, is there any role of uh, endoscopic uh, elastography uh, for uh, procuring the yield or increasing the sensitivity or specificity of the ebus uh, yes there are some papers which have spoken about that i personally don't know much about it i i haven't uh, read those papers in detail but i have actually read uh, somewhere uh, about this technique but i personally have never uh, i have not i don't know much details about it oh, okay 
but it is there Thank in some sir. paper. I, I definitely came across this word being mentioned, but I don't know the details of the technology. Okay, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Yes, uh, Sudhir Mishra. Uh, sir, uh, what are your protocols in uh, fire in the airway, other than the precautions what you told? <laughs> It's a disaster, I'm telling you. It's a disaster. I've never experienced it. Uh, touch wood, I don't want to experience it. Uh, the protocol is that you stop all burning. That's the protocol and you give steroids. You cannot, the, the fire is not a sustained fire. The problem is the burn that happens with the fire. So it is just one blast which causes the, the bronchial, uh, which causes bronchial mucosa burns. And the treatment is uh, give, uh, stop everything start oxygenating and give steroids. You have to give acute steroids. And this patient might need to be ventilated actually and kept in the ICU. So there is no, you cannot apply silver sulfur dioxide to that. It is all supportive management. Everything is supportive management in, in airway injuries, airway burns. In relational anesthesia, the agents uh, are avoided. Yes. Yeah, but more important is oxygenation of the patient. So once the moment you get into that situation, you are in a phase where you want to oxygenate the patient. So you you intubate the patient, take him into ICU, keep him intubated. I would give bang bang uh, anti-inflammatories. I would give uh, uh, steroids, uh, hydrocortisone, and things like that. So these are all supportive management. There is no real therapy of that burn. Once the burn has happened, it's happened. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Who is uh, so, so, sir? Did you want to ask me a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, before deployment of uh, all all of these stents, and uh, you were telling about the glue also. You you will be operating the mucus of the uh, involved bronchus in all the patients in all the cases. Yeah, when I'm dealing dealing with BPF, it's not a big operation. You just use a brush to lightly stroke the. It's not you're not causing massive bleeding or you know these are very tiny brushes and they are very uh, soft. But the what is the we upgrade is so that the, the bronchus so that the glue sets into the mucosa. The raw surface you're creating a raw surface for it too. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're doing. It's nothing. It's not rocket science. It's just uh, it's not mentioned in any randomized control trial. It's just uh, something you learn over the years. I mean, how successful is the glue in uh, in cases of uh, BPF, sir? Actually, I have over the years used glue in sleeping cases, and I've got away with four. And in in five, I I managed to control the BPF, as in make the patient aseptic and settle and all that, and then uh, did the surgery. Three or four, I have got away. But uh, it's, it's, it's very hit and miss. It's a very hit and miss. Small fistula, uh, non-septic patient uh, with uh, you know, a minimum uh, soiling of the other side. You can do glue. But most of the time you do glue as a buy, time buying technique where you don't want to pay later. Because at the end of the day, the way I treat bronchopleural fistulas is the I put in the, uh, either omentum or I put in muscle and things like that. So it is a, quite a big operation to treat bronchopleural fistulas for me. So if the patient is septic or is not well, then I don't want to uh, you know, take it to uh, bronchopleural uh, to surgery. So I use the glue just to buy time. So generally, will you... Uh, four, three or four, I think I can't remember the exact number, but I've had a few cases where I managed to get away with it. Uh, will you uh, freshen the area of the fistula before you close it or? Uh... That is another topic altogether. I will talk to you about it. I'll talk to you about it. It's, it's a, a very complex topic and I, I have a whole talk on it. It's a very complex topic. So it, 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 there's a lot of discussion within the context of the Next. Problem is freshening edges is uh, that you don't know where is the pulmonary artery underneath all that. <laughs> that is the problem. So you've got to be very careful when you're trying to put knife or scissors to the edge of the fistula. 
somewhere in that mass is a pa and if you cut into the pa there is no control because everything is infected and it's a very very bad situation so you got to be very careful the best thing is just cut it with a nice piece of prevention but it's a it's a whole topic by itself i'll discuss with you yes okay sanat kumar did you want to ask me a question hello yes sir good evening yes. sir uh, this dvrs is only a bridge to the uh, future uh, surgical intervention like uh, no, 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 no 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 that uh, it is now becoming primary treatment more and more data is coming through that dvrs might be the primary treatment. i don't think it's a bridge oh so it's on okay sir so oh So by doing a BVRS, we can actually avoid a bullectomy or a LVRS yes, nowadays. Yes, sir. But who knows? We don't know the long-term results. These are all new technologies. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Jibril's hand is still up. Did you want to ask something else, Jibril, or you are happy? Okay. Anybody else has any other questions to ask? There is some chat. I don't know what. Let's. Uh, I don't know when. You, uh, I don't know when you will be checking the. But uh, patients that have some blowout following surgery, uh, uh, say pneumonectomies, does any is the procedure possible for them? Yeah, we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll talk to you when I get there. There's a lot of it's a very complex topic. I don't want to just casually tell you something about uh, an implant's device and all that. There is something called as an implant's device, which is used okay. in in BPF, uh, but. Uh, outcomes are not great so i i don't want to talk about that at the moment when i talk about bp i'll give you all the details some people have tried the umbrella device but post pneumonectomy if you got a bpf you're in deep shit you need to sort it out thank you <laughs> okay thank you very much did it make sense guys was it all right yes thank sir it was it was wonderful fantastic wonderful today, today you have